All right. Hey, good afternoon, um, folks, or get morning to uh, those of you who may be calling from time zones well to the west of me. So um, this is a panel discussion on making strategic decisions to preserve and improve our breed. So we have a panel discussion coming up, and it's, um, it's this idea of trying to be strategic in how we make decisions to preserve and improve our breed. Um, this is what sets us apart from people who are simply producing puppies. So um, I asked a couple of people to help us out and play today. And um, well, that's what we're doing. So here's what we wanna do today. Um, I have a set of questions and topics that I sent out to um, the people who are serving as our panelists. And we're gonna go through these, letting the panel um, give us their thoughts and then open it to questions on those topics. Um, I want to tell you what those questions are so you have a sense of where we're going. At the end of those seven questions, um, I want to have some time for some additional Q&A um, and some final thoughts um, as we go through. So here's what we want to talk about today. These are the seven that I've come up with that I've given to our panel. Like, what makes a good brood bench? What makes a good stud dog? What makes a good combination of them? What tools and information do you use to make these kind of determinations? What are you looking to improve? What are you looking to preserve? And how do you assess how good your decisions were? We're gonna go through each of these seven questions one by one. For each question, I'm gonna ask the panel members their answers and thoughts, and then ask if, you know, once everyone on the panel has spoken, did it inspire something else the panel wants to say to us? And then open it to questions to all the rest of you but try to keep those questions on the topic, on, on those seven that we're working through one by one. There'll be time for unrelated questions at the end. And once they're all answered, we're gonna open it up to some additional questions and some final thoughts. So our panel, I asked six people who, um, um, who I thought would be a, a nice sort of representative way to get us started on this discussion um, to serve on our, our panel for today. We have Cindy Flowers, Ingrid Leiden, Peggy Helming, Jean McAdams, Suzanne Jones, and Devin Nutbeam. And so I briefly want to introduce each of these in sequence for you, starting with, with um, Devin. Um, Devin, you... Um, you're not muted, so maybe you want to say something while I um, while people can read some of the things. I love this photo of Devin. I think it's just a, like a lovely smile that we know from her. So, uh, hi everybody. I'm tickled to bits that this is being done. Kudos to Steve to uh, put this together for us. Um, I'd love to see a lot more discussion. Usually, we only get together and get a chance to uh, talk dog things at nationals. And of course, we've been raped of our nationals for two years in a row. So I guess it's going to be a real blowout next time around. But I love the opportunity. Thanks so much. Excellent. Our next uh, uh, panelist is Ingrid Leiden, who's been, you know, um, serving to dump uh, evildoers. Um, there. Um, well, good morning, everyone. I think I'm the only West Coast participant so uh, on the panel. So good afternoon to most of you. Um, I'm excited to be here, um, although maybe not so excited about Zoom since it's what I spend my life doing these days as a teacher. Um, however, it's exciting that so many of you want to be here um, and join us. Um, I'm looking forward to... Um, sharing a little bit that I know from having done this for a long time and having been fortunate enough to um, get to know so many amazing people like the ones on this panel and share thoughts and love the breed that we all have in common and have some fun times with them. Great, thanks Ingrid. Um, maybe you'd like to say something? Hi, <laughs> well, um, first off, thank you so much uh, for putting this together. Um, my favorite thing to do is to talk about uh, Newfoundlands. So I'm really looking forward to discussing these seven, seven different areas uh, with everyone, hearing opinions, offering up uh, what I can on my opinions of those issues. Um, who do we have next? We have Jean. Jean, can you say yes. uh, <laughs> Hi there. Um, a little more hair in this picture. Um, I'm recovering from the stem cell transplant, so I got the 
the hooded look. But I'm really happy to be here today and have the opportunity to share whatever we do note and um, and to discuss with everybody what your questions are. So and greetings to everyone. All right, last person. No, two more. We have Peggy, if you could introduce yourself. Hi there, everybody. It's wonderful to see faces of old friends that we haven't seen in over a year. And I'm happy that Steve put this together so that people can discuss and exchange ideas throughout the breed and have people listen to what's going on and what we found out through all the years we've been doing this. And good morning to everybody. Good morning to Ingrid and good afternoon to everyone else. All right, and last, um, just because I think this is the wittiest photo you could have submitted for yourself, <laughs> um, maybe we can have uh, Sue Jones introduce herself. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> hmm. Sue, can you unmute yourself? I know nothing about Zoom, so this is all new to me. So you're doing hi, great. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Very glad that this is happening. I think it's very important. Um, it's been a long time since we've had any kind of a creed or symposium. Um, and this is the best way to do it, I think, um, once I figure out how to participate in it. Mm. Um, I hope to see uh, more of this in the future as we go forward. Great. All right. Um, let's see if we can get back to this part. So let's get started with our panel discussion. I'm going to turn off the share screen and slides. So we can just have our panelists talk. These are the seven questions um, we want to go through. And we're going to just start with the first one. Um, if whoever of our panel wants to join in first, um, otherwise I will call on you. But so panel, what makes a good brew bitch? <laughs> How are you doing it, Steve? Calling on people? Um, if whoever wants to speak, but if you don't speak, I will call on you, <laughs> just like any good teacher. <laughs> <laughs> so Peggy, tell us, what, what makes a good brew bitch? Oh, lots of things, but basically she should be a quality specimen of the breed with a strong genetic background for the qualities you want her to contribute to your breeding program. The pedigree will help determine the above values. She should also have all of her health clearances completed. For starters. For starters. Um, I, one thing I agree with Peggy, but I also, one thing I wrote down was if at the end of the day, the puppy that you get out of this bitch, are you going to be excited to keep her if she's just like the mom? Or, you know, you should be thrilled that what you produced is as good, if not better than the mom. But if she, you know, I think I just find the biggest mistake people make is starting with something that's not good or just average and hoping they can get better instead of starting with ideally the best and trying to move on from there. Um, and so that would, uh, but along with the other health clearances and breed type and all of those things, and we're looking for combinations, but I think it's critical that our best animals are in the whelping box. And too many people want to start with average and get better instead of starting with the best. Uh, if I could comment on that um, also, because I did that many, many years ago. I, am, am I being heard? Yep. Okay, yeah. I can't tell, I can't tell. You're good, um, you're good. Many, many years ago, I started with what um, was a very mediocre bitch. I was encouraged and I probably, had, if I hadn't been encouraged, would never have better, but I probably also wouldn't be here today. And um, that could be a good thing or a bad thing. But um, she was a, um, a very mediocre bitch. I had guidance and I made a 
decisions early on that I concentrated on never looking back and never keeping anything that wasn't much better than her and the daughters that I bred down the line. But it was hard. So what I wrote down, I agree with what everyone's saying, is the first thing I wrote down is the bitch needs to have an excellent temperament. Um, I mean, it, it, of course, we want to follow in our standard, right? And so to me, that first thing, excellent temperament. If they don't have that, it, it, just don't move forward. A non-starter. Yeah, non-starter. I don't care how beautiful they are. Uh, I, I, just, I just don't. They need to really start off there. Um, the other thing I really look at with the brood bitch is that pedigree. I want to see uh, generations of health tested dogs um, going back. I mean, we can do that uh, looking back. Um, and thank you to everyone who has done those health testings through throughout the pedigrees uh, that are in my dogs. Um, so I really want that. And I also though wanna see uh, dogs that either I know, my mentors know, my peers know, uh, that are good rep representations of the breed. So really that, that's my must haves. Yeah, I really have to agree with everything that, that's been said so far. Um, huge, huge, huge. And particularly with respect to starting off with the best bitch you possibly can. It seems these days people first get their dog, decide they're going to breed, and then find out later whether or not it was worthwhile enough dog to use. And they spend the next seven or 10 or 15 generations, if they last that long in the breed, if they don't get frustrated or tired or disillusioned or whatever in that time. And so they learn after the fact as opposed to before the fact. So certainly without question, the, the first thing is pedigree and not just the depth of the pedigree, but the breadth of the pedigree. If there's any way you can find out information about the siblings of the parents, the grandparents, the great grandparents and see what the big picture is that you're dealing with. Because as I've often said, any good worthwhile combination is so not about the parents. I mean, yes, it's about the parents, but it's what they're bringing to the party, what they're caring, what you're going to be haunted by for generations to come if you're not aware of that. So with respect to which bitch to breed in terms of being a good brood bitch, you have all those factors that are terribly important to consider. And in she herself, ideally, you'd like her to be an excellent representative of the breed or as close to that as you can get to start with a great pedigree. But you want she herself to be a free whelper, if at all possible, um, handles stress with a plum, you know, doesn't mind people coming in to see her puppies. Um, she will leave the puppies to go out without stressing and freaking out. Um, that all goes to, to the temperament that Cindy was talking about, which is so terribly important, has a strong maternal instinct. Uh, she steps lightly around her puppies. She wants to be with her puppies. Um, all those okay being taken away from them. She cleans them, sorts them. Um, uh, and then too, that she's okay being bred, that she doesn't want to tear the male's head off. Um, and that the only way she could possibly be bred is AI because she refuses. She would never breed naturally if given the opportunity. So those kinds of things I think are terribly important as well. But certainly with respect to pedigree, the health clearances, the temperament, um, overall confirmation, not just of her, but of her parents, grandparents, their siblings, um, you know, coming from a line that means that she herself can produce herself if indeed she's a decent bitch. And uh, with ease of whelping and, and the quality of maternal behavior, I think those are all the factors that one wants to consider. Yeah, I don't think we've heard from Jean yet. Here I am. I did my button right. Um, I have to co confer with everything everyone said. Um, and as a demonstration, when we started out, um, Steve took, he, it was literally 18 months of total research. He studied every new tide and every pedigree and called every breeder he could find and did, he, we weren't getting a, a pet new, he wanted a foundation new one to start a, a kennel with. And um, we benefited a lot from that, um, from that research that he started out, which is what you've all, you know, addressed with looking at the pedigrees, but learning the standard well ahead of time and then looking at that breadth of pedigrees and the line um, really pays off in 
starting out with the quality that you want to in all the traits that you want to um, have your line get better with each time. Um, so I, 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 you know, say the same thing on all the traits that we're looking for. for the, but the other thing is, and we've become strong believers in, in the fact that um, your foundation, your bitch is produces or contributes a greater portion of the quality of your litter. Um, so the, the more perfect you can get with your bitch, the better off you're going to be. One thing I'd like to add too is it depends upon where, in my view, it depends upon where you are in your breeding program as to who that bitch is herself. So if you're starting off, absolutely you wanna start off with the best possible foundation bitch you have with all the attributes that we've just discussed. But when you're further along in your breeding program and you have an idea of where you wanna go, what that goal is that you're working towards, Sometimes you're going to use a bitch that has that she herself might not be any screaming hell, but she has the background and may be strong in certain traits that you're either cons wanting to consolidate in your line or bring into your line if you're lacking them. So you're going to concentrate on that particular trait that she carries, given that the rest are okay at least. But if she's strongly in her line and she herself has something that you badly need, then sometimes you would use what I call, and I have done this a few times, um, a stepping stone bitch. So she's never going to see the show ring. She's never any, any bitch you'd want to tout out and say, look at what I bred. But she does have something to offer. You won't know for sure if it worked for a generation or two or three. But um, you'll be pretty glad of it if she brings that to the equation. And then you can work on the type or whatever you need to do down the road. Um, I've got a bitch in my kennel right now. It's ugly as screaming hell. And uh, nobody's ever going to see her. But uh, she is bringing something to the equation. Her, all her siblings had this trait that I need. She has no fault per se, just the overall bitch is not something that uh, um, probably you jump up and down about. But uh, her first litter showed me that uh, yes, uh, what I needed from her came through and nothing bad came through. And uh, I'm really, really pleased. Now we'll see another generation or two if that further consolidated itself. But where a brood bitch is concerned, sometimes she's not got everything, but she's got what you need at the time. Um, so I wanna put up um, a poll question that I created on this topic. And I'd love to, you know, we have you know, 90 some people um, here on the Zoom call, um, it's, you know, click all that apply. So I'm going to launch that. It should show up for you. Um, and maybe this will inspire some of the attendees to answer questions. Make sure you scroll down. There's several choices from this. I'd love to see what people think. While the attendees, this isn't just for the panelists, this is for everybody. Um, while the, while um, the, while you're uh, looking at these questions and, and clicking what you choose, there were two questions that came in in the chat um, that maybe I can um, give to the panelists to, to, to take a look at. Um, someone asked, other than health and physical attributes, how much variety or lack thereof do you like to start with? A more tightly line bred bitch or a more genetic or more genetic variability? What do you mean by genetic variability, Steve? So I think some, someone that is an outcross of an outcross of an outcross versus oh, something that what has mean. been um, more tightly line bred. I, I, answered I, that. Yeah. I answered that question privately to the person in the chat but um, earlier, but I, my thought would still be it depends on that particular animal and where you're going with it and who you're breeding it to. If this is your brood bitch, if she's an outcross, then maybe I'm looking at a more tightly line bred uh, stud dog for her that maybe shares something. Um, and there might be a reason I needed to use this outcross. On the other hand, it, it, the reverse would be true. If my bitch is a more tightly line bred bitch, maybe I'm looking to um, expand my diversity by going to more of an outcross. Or, you know, I've got a line bred, I want to preserve that and I continue into that. So I think it, that's hard to say as just a blanket statement. I think it just depends on where you're going with your, with your breeding choice. Yeah. Anyone else want to add? 
Well, I, I would tend to agree with um, Ingrid. I'm, I'm very much a pedigree breeder. I look at the pedigree very hard on the animals I use. Um, but, and I prefer line breeding, but there are times when you need to go out. And um, I think you have to make those decisions on each bit as to what you do, depending upon the pedigree that you're working with. And if you need, need to make some changes. Yeah. Okay. Another question that came in on the, the chat um, regarding clearances. I hear emphasis on clearances being done, but where is the importance on actually clearing those x-rays? Often I see dogs being bred who have not cleared x-rays. Under what circumstances do you decide to do that? And I'm thinking what we have is someone asking that this is uh, an animal where x-rays have been evaluated. So you have an assessment, but you nonetheless um, maybe choose to go forward with, a, uh, with breeding a bitch, even though the clearances may not be as perfect as you had hoped. Oh, That's there's no question. question in my mind about the answer to that one. I don't know about anybody else, but um, I, I suspect there are a number of people who might agree with me. But without question, clearances are really, really important simply because they're not it's a merely dominant recessive trait. That would make us all just be laughing with glee if that was the case, but it's not. It can haunt you for generations afterwards. So I'm a, a huge proponent of uh, clearing everything that you breed. That doesn't mean to say that I think it's not good to breed a dog that doesn't have all its clearances if it's got, if it's a really stellar representative of the breed. But in that case, it depends on the background. If the background is stellar, and you have a dog that hey maybe have an elbow didn't clear or or hips were a borderline or a, or a mild um, but the background is really stellar parents grandparents great grandparents then by all means you don't want to be thrown out that dog has got too much to offer but if the dog is coming from relatively weak uh, background of clearances there comes a point where you have to draw the line and it, that's different for every breeder but um, uh, for instance, I've perfect example of how something can come and haunt you. I've got a bitch right now, just did clearances last week. And she went DJ, DJ D1 in one elbow. And I was shocked because her parents, her grandparents, every one of them, her great grandparents, every one but one had all their clearances and all goods are excellence. And uh, so where did that elbow come from? Well, four generations back, there was a bitch that had DJD1 in an elbow, and, but neither of her parents had elbows. So, and I looked at siblings as much as I could find out too. And the siblings as a rule were very strong. So it can come back to haunt you um, when you least expect it. And of all the, but I had three bitches done last week. Everybody cleared everything except for her. And yet she's the one I kind of went, oh, well, that's going to be no problem. She got to go with flying colors. Nobody was more shocked than me when I got back the results because my vet thought they looked great. So just, I, I don't think you can be too strict on clearances. However, you really got to keep in mind the quality of the overall bitch and the quality of the pedigree. But I think that the key is you say, okay, if I'm going to breed that bitch, I'm going to be super strict with what I keep about, keep out of her. So if she has stuff not clearing, I draw the line there. Will you use this bitch in your program now? Yes, because sure. she's got, yeah, because she's got three generations behind her, absolutely everything clear. But I will be more strict about what I breed her with and it's back and the studs background. Who you're using to be able to include the qualities that she has. Exactly. I think that's how every breeder would think. You're not gonna throw the baby out with the bath water in a breed like this. Because right, right, right. We, we, we got well, so- I have, to, I have to disagree a little bit. This is Jean. We, we put our line strict and we haven't bred a bitch that didn't have all our clearances. And um, we've sacrificed some beautiful opportunities um, in doing so. But um, it's what you want to live with and how, how you want to better the breed. You know, it's all a matter of choices. Um, and what we're going to have and what we're gonna, puppies that we're going to give to people is really important for us that they're, they're healthy. And, you know, you can't make it perfect. So the best we can do is to make sure our bitches are starting out with their clearances as far as our line. So for me, um, when I look at the tests we have, we literally have one genetic test right now. Everything else is an opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Um, so I look forward to the day where we have more tools to use as breeders. I do think, you know, those x-rays and looking at them and looking at them with a critical eye is very important. 
Um, but I'm looking forward to that day as a breeder uh, for the future of the breed when, when we have more genetic tests to, to help us with our choices. And I think I concur with all of that. And you've really got to look at the breadth. I mean, you got to look at the siblings more than just, you know, just generational. You got to look at the broadness of all the siblings. Um, and as Cindy mentioned, it is someone's opinion. And so, and I see this came up as a question, but often you can send x-rays in to multiple people and get different opinions on those x-rays. OFA also, you get the lowest ranking. You don't get the report that says you got two goods and a fair. You get told you got a fair because you get the lowest of the three. But right now we don't get, unless you have an inside track with someone, you don't usually get that extra knowledge of knowing that you actually got three different opinions. You could have gotten an excellent, a good and a fair, but your dog came back a fair. So do sometimes, do people resubmit yeah, I mean, I wouldn't, I've would i never resubmitted the same x-ray. I've certainly reshot films thinking the films maybe weren't so good. Um, also with DJ, I think elbows are that DJD1 level. So many vets will be like, oh, I look okay to me, but that DJD1 level is very gray. Um, it, but it, I, I mean, I, and I personally believe elbows are a much bigger concern in our breed yeah. than hips in terms of the function of the dog. Dogs do way better when their hips are not so good than they do when their elbows are not so good. But obviously we all wanna put out healthy animals. The, the biggest backyard breeder wants to put out a healthy animal because they don't want more problems either. But we can breed generations to generations and still get dogs that don't clear. So we have to look at those big pictures, uh, quality vet care, quality uh, health care, there's so many factors that go into a dog clearing or not clearing. And sometimes they had an injury as a, as a young dog or, you know, and you it can, that can cause that DJD1, but do you excuse it or not excuse it? Those are all individual decisions at some point. And I think that's quickly... very important because you're carrying 70%, the dog is carrying 70% of his weight on his front end. Yes, so yes. Vital that that be a strong suit. Mm -hmm. I'm going to quickly jump in here. I want to show um, the results of what um, people said in the polls, because I think that's really illuminating. Um, more people than, you know, the, the highest vote, because this was choose three of, is the dam exhibits desirable temperament. Yeah. Um, followed by the dam has parents, grandparents with a strong record of health clearances, which I think is what we're touching on here with these kinds of questions demonstrated good confirmation to the standard in her parents and grandparents. The dam herself exhibits good confirmation and has several health clearances. Um, past success in producing healthy puppies. Um, so, you know, we have a good sense. And, and if people have other ideas, these were just some that I threw out there more to inspire thought and discussion um, than anything else. Um, let's see, there was another... Um, Someone asked, does the panel have any opinion on pen hip versus OFA? Um, OFA being more qualitative or subjective or an opinion as Cindy um, stated. Um, and and the, the, the person asking the question says black and white with pen hip, which it is a, a more quantitative measure. At least it's deceptive. No, I shouldn't say deceptive. It, it, it gives us numbers to, to, you, to work from. I got a huge opinion there. <laughs> <laughs> Pen, pen hip is a, an excellent tool in a breeding program. Um, a lot of people want to say, and I've heard this said, and I cringe when I hear it, oh, we passed his pen hip or he failed his pen hip. There's no pass or fail to pen hip. Pen hip is a really good tool if you're going to use it over generations. That's the point of it. It's not what that one individual dog is. That one individual dog is only significant in relation to all those who went before and their pen hip scores. The idea is you breed a better and better pen hip score as you go along. Problem in our breed is so few people are doing it that it's a job to find a stud dog that has his pen hip done so that you know and, and the background. I'm in my 12th generation of doing 
doing pen hip right now and I've proven to myself that it works in in uh, in clearances getting better and better and those dogs still moving at 10 and 11 years of age the same way they did when they were five I've got a 10 year old out there now with an excellent pen hip and uh, you should see her just floating across my backyard and leaping over stuff that she shouldn't even be attempting, but she does it with great ease. And I really believe that pen hip is a very strong, um, uh, much stronger utilization tool than OFA. OFA and pen hip measure two different things. So whilst I think OFA is excellent in the moment, I have, I, and I'm now redoing pen hip uh, on my eight, nine year olds that had pen hips done when they were two. I'd like to build up a history to see how they progressed over time, both the poor hen pen hip scores at two years of age and what they were when they were older, as well as the better ones and how that compared to their OFA um, x-rays. So ask me another 10 or 15 years what I think, but uh, if I'm still senile then, of course, but um, I really, I'm a strong, strong believer in the worth of pen hip in a breeding program. Well, I'm just going to say something good about OFA because I've never done pen hip to have a discussion on that. But I am 50 years into this, and I think that we've made great strides with what the OFA has done for us. Maybe yes. not as much in elbows, but I don't know that anybody does that any differently. But in hips, there's no longer the fear of going in with some promising youngsters and getting pictures taken. And generation after generation, the improvement is evident and it's consistent. So I think that it's a, a great thing for us. And if pen hip turns out to be better, I'm sure that'll come along with years too. But I don't think OFA has failed us much in that department. I think they've moved a breed that was very dysplastic into a very sound hip x-rays. Not so nice moving sometimes, but sound ones. And I have 10 and 12 year olds, Devin, that move around with their OFA hips, just like you're talking about. So sure. I think we share information and there is always a better way to do something at some point. But right now, if I, I wouldn't change what I'm doing, I guess is what I'm gonna say. I don't know how other people feel. I agree with you there, Peggy, wholeheartedly, and, and I would never advocate not doing OFA as well. I think both tools that used in concert is the ideal thing. Um, you're measuring two different things, but I wouldn't say one is better than the other, or you should do one, not the other. I would never advocate that. I think using them both in concert and trying to get optimal results in both is key. So right. since um, Devin, when she was talking about Pan hip, she brought up about you know finding a good stud dog. I'd like us to move on to that question. Like what? Oh, great segue. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, and you're good. <laughs> if not stick. Um, what makes a good stud dog? And while our panel is is going through and talking, I have that same, a very similar poll question for people. What three are the most important in choosing to have a litter out of a Newfoundland stud dog? So feel free to click what choices you have, but you know, maybe Ingrid, since I see your face first, what makes a good well, study? First of all, they better have excellent sperm. Um, <laughs> and living out here on yes. the West Coast, living out here on the West Coast, uh, I want a dog that can be collected easily. I want a dog that can be shipped. I used to be able to fly. Some of you know, I used to fly every summer with my dogs, would fly into the East Coast to get them bred. That's near impossible to do anymore. And I can't really drive from here to the East Coast. And I, for my own preference, have incorporated a lot of dogs from all over the world. And so being able to access good sperm is super important. And a lot of dogs can't be collected. So I personally, with my own males, I train them young and I try to get them so I can collect them whether or not there's a bitch in heat whether, and I have a microscope here at home. I am a bio, you know, I was a biology major. So I do my own evaluation. So first and foremost, they got to do that. Um, too many of them don't have good sperm. Um, and then I think you start, you know, in terms of the particular dog, that's where we got to look at all these other pieces, right? Is there a, a, a sire that um, maybe you've seen some of his breedings and you see a dog that stamps particular qualities onto their puppies? You, I can remember certain nationals going and going, well, you can tell that one's out of, and whichever dog, I'll use the name Todd, I remember in the early 2000s, it was like, 
you could look at all these headpieces and just know that that dog was out of Todd, okay? Because he stamped his head. And if that was maybe what you were really looking for, that was a reason. But then again, a stud dog can be just as valuable who's willing to step back and let the strengths of a really beautiful bitch. And, and maybe they bring in that nice blending, but the stud dog himself brings in this good health, maybe brings in maybe beautiful coat or something, but maybe it's not some of those obvious traits, but if I'm taking this bitch that I really wanted to preserve her qualities, maybe there's a stud dog that, that um, tends to take that back seat um, or do they do the big combination? And I obviously, I think it, it's very situational. Um, and then of course, we're looking at health clearances and temperament and um, you know, what, are, how do they behave? You know, those are all those things, but again, that becomes individual. So that's where I'd start. I, I have to agree with Ingrid there too. Um, um, we've been using a dog um, that was an older dog that was living in somebody's home and getting him collected and getting anything out of him was just totally nightmarish. And um, we've managed to get um, two litters, two small litters out of the dog and consider ourselves lucky we're keeping those puppies now um, for the time being and growing them out. But um, seeing a dog and seeing that can stamp certain things and be dominant in certain things is great. Um, and also um, having a dog with a really line bred pedigree for what you're looking for. Uh, but basically the same that you, you want the health, you want the meeting the standard, you want all the things that you'd want in a good brood mix too. But um, sperm, I have sperm seems to be an issue lately. Yes, right? sperm. Finding a stud yeah. dog said that's a great dog and then you find out he doesn't have any sperm. Someone it. followed up, what is considered good sperm? What key points or numbers are you looking for? <laughs> well, they're, not, that they're alive to start with. Some of these <laughs> lives. I was gonna say, I'm not scientific about it. I don't have my own scope, but I know when I see tons of stuff swimming around and I know when I see a few odd things living. So, um, you know, I, but I don't, I don't have a reproductive vet that's collecting and Generally, sometimes I'm using a dog that does have a reproductive that that, that um, collects and tells you how many billion or this or that or the other. I just know what I look at from my own scope. I think this um, the ownership of a stud dog and the quality of a stud dog, all that goes the same for the brood bitch, et cetera. But I do think that the stud dog is an important piece of it because they can ultimately influence the breed far more than the bitch by the sheer number of offspring they produce. Yeah. Yeah. It also means that you have more information available about said stud dog because you can go around and see litters out of him. You can see dogs in the ring out of him, which is more information than you can probably gather on the bitch. Um, I want to know everything about a stud dog that's unfamiliar to me. Um, I want to talk soundness, but I don't just mean hips and elbows. I want to ask about the character and temperament of that stud dog, skin issues, hearts, patellas, eyes, thyroid, etc. And it's all part of the big picture. If you have the good fortune to manage a young stud dog, be sure to take this responsibility seriously. Be sure to keep reliable records on his litters, get out and see as many puppies out of him as you can, and give this information to anybody freely and honestly when they call to ask you about it. It's vitally important. Um, sometimes I call it the flavor of the month for stud dogs. Everybody sees one puppy out of a dog and boom, the phone starts ringing and <laughs> runs to the yeah. spa, right? And, and they, I said, do you know anything about it? Oh no, it's just a beautiful dog. I yeah. saw out of him at the, do you know his battery? No, does he have any? It's just like they get so excited. I would get excited too, but the next step is to follow through and to have the stud dog owners totally honest about what these dogs are producing and not just on health issues, on everything. Everything that they're producing that you can find out before you go into it. If they're your own dogs, you have your answers certainly yourself. But it's, um, 
they bring to you, you find out what they bring to the table if you ask enough questions. You just have to ask them and don't be afraid to. I know a lot of people call here and they say, well, you know, we don't know exactly how to ask you this, but does so-and-so throw good temperaments, you know, and then we can discuss it. And once you open people up, they have more questions and more questions. And this is, the communication on this is vital because they can so much affect the breed more than the, the dam can. Not in the quality of the puppies the dam has. I still think the dam is more important, but when you're using a dog a lot, you're going to get certain problems and virtues and you need to be alarmed, you know, aware of those problems and what to look for. If you can, there's a lot of new stuff that pops up with every generation that you, you didn't expect, so to speak. All right, so I, I'm gonna end, end the poll so folks can see what was written and um, share the results. As we might expect, it's gonna be really similar to what people thought for the, the bitch. Most important was exhibiting the desirable Newfoundland temperament. Parents and grandparents with a strong record of health clearances, followed by um, good confirmation in his parents and grandparents, his own good confirmation and his own health clearances. Um, I, I want to hear if there's if the panel has any more thoughts on the stud dog, but I'm going to throw, I'm going to insert something here, um, mainly to, to be a bit of a devil's advocate, that um, it seems some of the questions that people are, are throwing at the panel in the chat and the responses here in the poll question are, what's really important is, what's most important is to have good demonstrated health clearances and a temperament. Um, I think any backyard breeder could achieve that. What makes a good Newfoundland beyond health clearances and temperament? Um, and so um, if the panel wants to add anything about the stud dog, but I also want to talk about um, that third question, which is what makes a good combination of sire and dam in a puppy? I'd just like to add one thing on the stud dog, if I may, um, uh, and then uh, you can certainly move on. Um, one has to, a good stud dog has to have an owner that's easy to work with. <laughs> you know, sometimes there are great stud dogs, but the owners are so difficult. You just sort of say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm getting too old for this, you know, and, and it's a sin. That's a sin because we have too few really worthwhile stud dogs in our breed, but um, that are available and have semen and, and all the rest of it. And the other thing is, it really is important. A stud dog is, you really, only really know how good a stud dog is till you've seen his get. And, and the next generation as well. So one that produces very well with a variety of bitches. And that's why going to specialties is so important to sit at ringside with your catalog and try and find out how a dog is producing with a variety of bitches and how much of he brings to the equation himself. And if he's only just providing the semen and, and the bitch is always the one coming through. That's really important information to have as well. Um, and that he consistently produced his best features and not his faults. And, and the best features in his line and not his faults. And that's why sometimes it's so important to make sure that these guys are frozen so that, because you don't always realize who the best stud dogs are until you see those generations coming through. I agree, Devin, a lot with um, trying to, again, do the research on what they produce, whether it be out there as a puppies or also as time goes on, how what they produce holds together or, you know, how the history on the health um, turns out because it's only after time that you find out a lot of things. Um, and, you know, it, that takes a long time to end by that time, you know, that's why having frozen is really important because sometimes time you see a really complete picture on a stud dog, you know, they're starting to get up in years. So, um, and one thing we've done over the years is, is, um, done videos with moving puppies at seven mm -hmm. weeks and then watching them later and in, in going in slow motion and yeah. and not just our litters but we've gone and, and done that with other breeders you know as, as as you share and it it teaches your eye better on trying to see what what is being produced um, but it, it is important to to look at the quality of what a sub dog is producing and that he produces better than himself. Right. 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 That's what we're all working towards. 
better. And, and you know, as Sue mentioned, in line breeding, we've we've been strong on that too over the years. And you know, I think you can once you have quality on both sides, you can stamp stamp it better or more strongly with the inbreeding, not inbreeding with line breeding. Line breeding. I do, I just to jump in, uh, the one thing I, I think in, in that we should, what Peggy brought up about the transparency um, that we share with each other, uh, that is truly our way to make, you know, keep the breed moving forward. Uh, sharing our knowledge, the good, the bad, the ugly um, with each other is, is so critical. Mm -hmm. and, and I concur with that piece. I think, um, I don't know, kind of looking at this panel, most of us are not a uh, big time social media people. And yet I think a lot of people pick their stud dogs and pick their breeding choices based off the dogs that they've seen lots of pictures of. And, you know, if you're posting something, I'm assuming we'll post good pictures or you've made them into good pictures. So you need to talk to people. You need to, uh, you need to get on the phone and have conversations when we can, you need to go and go to the national and go to regionals and travel around and see dogs, you know, so many, you know, I'm out here on the West Coast, you guys, nobody comes out here and visits our dogs. If we don't take them, you don't, you guys wouldn't see them, you know, but uh, going back and watching old videos of nationals, I used to sit and watch, I have the video ones, you know, and watching the dogs, but so many people today live in the moment and they're just looking for what's on Facebook. And when I exactly. say, you, know, yeah. you can put anything on Facebook, you can be anybody on the internet as we well know. And having these real conversations with people, people don't do it near like they used to. And my phone bill, when I used to have to pay by the minute, <laughs> unbelievable, you know? I, mean, and, I remember one hanging on the wall in Peggy's kitchen for a long time years ago. I think it's still there. David, it is. <laughs> well, I think so you got to talk to each other. Well, and this is something you're demonstrating that, that that the fact that all of you are saying about working with each other has been so important that this is something really difficult to do in isolation. Important and rewarding too. Yeah. Rewarding. Yeah, yeah that's a really good. Point. I think I think brain picking brain picking whenever you can is a huge part of it. And I know when I first started out. One of the things that um, my early mentor, Wilma Lister, had me do was not just join the breed clubs, but join the all breed clubs. I learned tons of stuff from a standard schnauzer breeder. I learned stuff from lab breeders. I learned stuff from, I still learn from a golden breeder that's a good friend of mine. And I think the more brain picking and talking you do, it's amazing how much you can learn. Yeah. So I'm sharing the results from this third question about, you know, how do you know you've made a good combination or what are the most important in selecting a good combination? And again, health seems to be a, 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 an important consideration. Good confirmation is creeping up there. Seem likely to produce puppies that exhibit positive attributes of the sire and dam and improve on shortcomings on the sire and dam. I think that's, um, that's mm -hmm. kind of a, a, a cool thing. So, um, and this actually, there's a question that came in. There's several great questions coming in in chat, and I'm, I'm sorry I'm not getting to all of them. Um, but someone just said, how close would you line breed? When would you look at outcrossing? What would you outcross to fix faults, bring in a trait you want, help lower uh, coefficient of inbreeding or for other reasons? And along the lines of that, um, I'd love us to move on. Um, and if you want to have any wrap up questions about the combination, but, but related to that combination question was my fourth one which I think this is where you're really heading. What tools and information do you use to make the determinations of good brood bitch, good stud dog, good combination? You're, you were talking about that in terms of communicating with each other, um, but what other things, what tools do we have at our disposal to make good decisions? Um, so if anyone wants to uh, uh, join in there. Well, I'll start it off because there's a lot of subject matter here. I think decisions for determining the combinations you make are basically through conversations, observations, and research. Um, they'll all lead you to some good dialogue with your fellow breeders, fellow exhibitors, in determining, you know, 
a clear picture, mental picture of what it is you are looking to produce based on your working knowledge and studying of the standard, which guides you to these decisions also. Um, have conversations uh, like we've all been talking about our telephone bills from years ago. Uh, they were pretty high because we were on the phone for hours, not minutes, talking things through, working things through, sharing information. I think that's where your decisions will come from. And then you have all your social media, you have your new tie, nationals, regional specialties, attending those or Paramount, um, your OFA pages that you can look up everything on. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of information out there, but the, you have to first have a clear idea of what you yourself, because interpretations are going to happen, you know, and they're going to vary and they may differ, but we're all bound as breeders, exhibitors, even judges on our official breed standard. And it gives us boundaries and we should all know them, even though our interpretations may be slightly different here and there. Um, we all know that um, that will, those words will give us an idea of what we're trying to do when we make a, com a, a combination and make the decisions. And it's mainly based for me a lot on observations, but you got to go out and get those observations. You got to go looking, which right now is impossible, but it'll come back. Yeah, one of the tools I used when I started out was I was provided access from talking to people to old new tides. So this was like in 1991 when, and I sat and poured through all of those new tides from the seventies and eighties. And I created my own pedigree database so that that's how I learned everybody's pedigrees. I sat and did manually inputted all these dogs and going back so that I, because people were like, how do you know this? And I was like, oh, cause I sat there and spent hours making a database that then I had learned you know, oh, there was this dog and that dog because I was new. You know, I was 22 years, 23 years old, didn't know anything when we started out, kind of. So, um, reaching out and taking advantage of that, those old NIF tides were really valuable. And, like I said, old national videos and watching those. Um, and then, you know, I started going to my first national and I've been to every one since. Um, and getting involved, I think people like Peggy mentioned, knowing the standard. You need to go to judges education. You need to go ahead. Anyone can go to the presentations that are held at our, um, when they're held in your region or in at the national. Make sure you understand the standard. Yes, we each interpret things about it differently, but have you received that education so you really know those fine points of what we call essential to a Newfoundland as, a, as our breed standard and as we're trusted to preserve as preservation breeders. I think, and this is a little bit related, um, maybe not exactly, but another thing that you have to bring to the table is you have to be honest with yourself. You have to be really honest in critiquing the animals you have in your backyard and seeing them as critically as possible and comparing them to the, the standard and trying to make decisions on where to go with them when you breed them. I think most people who know me know that I'm a pretty critical in general of dogs but I'm most critical of my own. And I think that helps keep your head straight in trying to make decisions on where to go with each animal. And that's why it's really it, critical to build relationships. And when, I, when people say, why do I want to go to a national? I haven't got anything to show. Showing is only one part of a national. Building relationships, getting to see what else is out there, informing yourself as to the kinds of traits that are important that maybe you don't have yourself. And if you only are looking at your own dogs in your own backyard, they're all going to start looking pretty damn good to you. So you got to get out there and see what else is available and see what it looks like and say, oh, gee, I need more bone or, oh, gee, I don't have that much reach in my dogs. And then uh, formulate a way of, okay, what do I need to do with my breeding stock in order to start incorporating those things that I'm missing? And I think when you're talking about what makes a good combination of dogs to breed, it depends on where you are in your breeding program. Um, if you're just first starting out, if you're first learning, if you're only in your first couple of years, or if you're at a point where you've got your dogs to a certain a certain stage what combinations do you need to be doing going forward in order to make a difference in order to um, get where you want to going and I think one of the things that worries me is that I don't think a lot of people have an idea of what their goal is in breeding what is it you want to get to 
I think you need to decide at the outset, uh, what is the goal of dog you want to consistently produce? What's the style you eventually want all your dogs to resemble? You want to identify those priority traits specifically. You know, are you talking about upper arms? Are you talking about top lines? Are you talking about bones, substance, size, head type? Um, and, and don't compromise on any of them in any combination. There are, I think you, you have to decide what are your own deal breakers long before you're in an emotional position of making a decision on using a stud or doing a breeding. You want to decide for yourselves, what are my deal breakers and what am I never going to compromise on or how much am I willing to compromise before I draw the line. And so when you're talking about what constitutes a good combination, all those kinds of factors come into the decision making process um, and it's not always the same for every breeder and it depends on what stage of your breeding program you're in. I agree a lot with um, breeding to the standard which Ingrid brought up and then the honest evaluations both of in your own kennel and and going out and studying it you know at every opportunity you can. Both of those factors I think you know, can help us get forward and, and go where we want to go, which is your point, Devin, of trying to know where you want to go. You know, and uh, so some of the tools in addition, of course, the standard, the illustrated guide that the NCA has out there has been very valuable to me going back and continually reviewing that. I do think attending shows, even the national, uh, you know, that's our where we see so many from all over the country and sometimes through the world um, coming. But even just going to regular dog shows where Newfoundlands are being shown or even looking at results throughout the country um, through on info dog or row dogs, um, looking at those results because I wanna see not just a name of a dog who's being shown but potentially the pedigrees that are combined of those dogs that are being out there working events uh, as well, um, you know, another way to, to see dogs um, and see in, in their elements. Um, the other tool I, I use a lot <laughs> is the Newfoundland database uh, from, uh, that is, uh, let's see, it's the one where you, where I pay actually to be able, you know, a premium uh, uh, price, to be able to combine pedigrees um, and they do the calculations for me on those ancestor loss coefficients. Uh, so I do pay attention to those uh, and I try in my own mind not to be go below certain numbers um, for my line bread uh, before I go back out. Um, and then you know, as everyone said, I think uh, talking to people, mess I, I do a lot of messaging, um, uh, you know, messenger, because I type fast and I, it allows me to get back and forth or email, um, but whatever our form of communication, uh, talking to your mentors, talking to other people, getting that information, totally. And, and finally, back to OFA, the advanced search on OFA is awesome. Uh, to be able to go through and search, I want to find all of the males uh, for the la you know last ten years, uh, and you know maybe let's just get a couple clearances going through there, and you can you know download that into it. You know it comes out as a spreadsheet, so I cannot uh, stress enough that that's one of my main tools also as well. Uh, to, to doing research, so. Cindy, I'm glad you brought up the working because I think that is a total reflection of the quality of, of the breed. Um, when, when you have a beautiful confirmation dog and their structure's wonderful and they're beautiful specimens and um, they have clearances and, and then when they can put those with that structure to work, when they have the, the mental capacity and the desire to go out there and do what is natural to them, I mean, that's probably one of the strongest points of joy I have is, is watching 
that come together, the whole picture come together. I've seen, oh, Go ahead. sorry, I saw a few people in the chat asking about, you know, oh, sharing evaluations or how, when you look at puppies and stuff, again, being out here, I'm often um, utilizing dogs in other parts of the country. We have a real regimented way that we videotape our puppies that, because I'll ask people to send me a video, like when our stud dogs had puppies. Um, and then I'm like, I need to explain how I do it because I have this whole regimented way. And then I send that um, often to Peggy who then helps me go through it. And it's really cool because she'll watch a video and, and, I'll watch, and I'll be talking live to her while she's watching it. But there's like a real way to do it and talk about it. And then incorporating, I think um, Sue mentioned it, other breeds, like when I'm going over puppies, I happen to have some very good friends that are, you know, um, Doberman breeders or Great Pyrenees breeders, or, and some of them are, you know, they're high level of their own breed. Um, maybe they've handled or they're judges, um, whatever, they'll come and go over puppies and for me and just kind of give me their opinion and looking at it from a different lens than the lens I have, um, you know, but I think those are some of the, the really important tools to use um, to, to have those, again, those conversations and, and yeah, if people want to come, but I don't know, I don't see you guys getting on a plane to come out here and look at my litter. So, um, but I do think that's, that's one of the ways to, to look at them too, but be willing to drive. When I hear someone say, well, that stud dog's four hours away. What the heck? Uh, exactly. Like, I'd be <laughs> about, so thrilled, you know. Exactly. Yeah, that's, yep. it's uh, it's uh, nothing to drive 30 hours to a stud dog. Gracious. <laughs> What's the problem? <laughs> I think, too, um, um, not enough time is spent, more so maybe with the new people, certainly with the tried and true people uh, being at a national, sitting at ringside and, and learning what's in from what's in the ring is, is really huge information. Building relationships with people to be able to pick up the phone and call them and saying, I'd really like to bend your ear on such and such a dog. One of the things that I found uh, really helpful is, um, especially where I'm kind of isolated down here in the East Coast of Canada, I'm the only Newfoundland dog breeder um, for <laughs> provinces around. And, uh, and so I'm really constrained by getting um, uh, breed feedback uh, on a regular basis. And one, only once have I been able to drag Sue Jones up here and she never came back. I don't know what I did, but anyway. Um, so I do really rely on people, other working dog breeds and other sporting breeds to have them come out and help me evaluate puppies because they're evaluating from a bit of a different perspective, but we do share a number of important attributes too. And so I move the puppies and the dogs. I take them out to their place where they're in a um, whole new environment and, and get them to put through the paces the same as they would evaluating their own litters. And I found that to be really helpful to me sometimes. They'll pick up on something that I'm not really noticing or putting enough priority on. And so utilizing the experience of other breeders, they don't have to be in our breed is a huge, uh, a huge uh, source of information sometimes. I agree with that. Uh, um, actually, I have a really, uh, she's, she's a judge and a, as well as a breeder, but my re reproduction vet, um, and so when we take our puppies in just even for their health tests and she'll go over them from her perspective, she breeds yeah. terriers. And, uh, and then she always, one of my favorite things she said is, is uh, sell on the table, buy on the ground. <laughs> so <laughs> I love that. It's, it's like uh, that watching them move around. I mean, I, I want my hands so I can feel those puppies on that table or those dogs on the table. But really watching them, there's no, you know, that, those videos that, that Ingrid is talking about or, or watch, hopefully being able to watch them in person, moving around uh, freely even, uh, see what your eye is drawn to. Um, Anyways. And I'm a visual person. So one of the things I do do, um, and sometimes it's so depressing, I don't do it for a little while afterwards, but I try to draw a chart 
of all the dogs in the pedigree and the attributes of each, uh, both in terms of the, the easy to pinpoint ones, the clearances, but the not so easy to pinpoint ones. You know, how long is this one through the loin? What's the bite like? How does this dog move? How does he use himself? What's he like coming at you and going away? And I try to sort of have this huge, huge wall of a chart and go down and, and sometimes I see things that I wasn't really remembering um, when I'm, I'm putting a combination together or I'm evaluating that litter and sort of saying, oh damn, I better keep this puppy because there's actually more of a preponderance of, of straightness in the background or, or uh, small, two dogs too small or something or other in the background. This visual look of the, of the big picture of every dog in the pedigree back four generations, that sometimes affects the decision of a puppy I'm going to make. So that chart I've found to be hugely helpful as well. It's a visual representation of where the emphasis is in the background and maybe what I should be um, aiming for in the puppies. Um, I want to go back to, we talked about stud dogs needing to have healthy sperm, but I also feel like in the big picture of things um, that the whole reproductive history on both the foundation bitch you have and, and the stud dog, you know, how fertile they really are, what's the history, what kind of size of litters they may have or not have, and what kind of whelpers they are. You know, are they easy whelpers or not? Are they natural mothers or not? And I know, uh, Devin, you brought up some of those characteristics, but in that whole big picture of, of where we take the breed is, is, that's another real strong factor I think we need to pay attention to is just the reproductive health of, of, the, of our breed. Um, I am in a little bit different position there because um, I have scheduled C-sections since 2007 on all of my bitches. And I do it because I don't have access to quality veterinary care in emergency situations. And I had enough bad things go wrong that I just, with the timing that we are able to use now with progesterone timing, I've been scheduling sections. So I couldn't tell anybody about the whelping health of my bitches. Um, I did find in the years that they were whelping that I had some that uh, were free whelpers and their daughters were not and vice versa. I, I don't know, but right now um, that would be a blind spot for me. I think a lot of people are in that boat in, in especially in the States um, that uh, you can't get good veterinary help uh, in an emergency situation or, or anybody who knows anything about reproduction and, and uh, sectioning. And that's, uh, that's a huge fear. I'm, that's one lucky part about living where I live is that the vet is 10 minutes from me and I'll go knocking at his door at two in the morning and he will come. <laughs> so I'm, I'm really fortunate that way, but I know increasingly uh, people aren't. And uh, I, I know a lot of people do what you do, Sue. So. Well, you know, at least we have science and good vets that do C-sections that, you know, we yes. can take care of the situations yeah. that we're in, you know. Um, but in the perfect world, I think that's important to, to want the breed to be healthy in reproduction. But I certainly understand, Sue. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, this might be a good place. We've been getting a lot of great questions in chat. Um, since I had turned off um, for the security things, the chance to unmute themselves, would anyone like to ask a question of the panel on these first four questions um, verbally? If you do, raise your hand in the participants window and, um, and I'll let you unmute to ask a question. Um, if not, um, and, and in addition to that, if, the, if any of the panelists see some of these questions in the chat, if you'd like to uh, tackle any of them. I'm sh I'm saving some for the end. Um, I'm not seeing the chat. So. I think you have to open up the chat window. You go down to the bottom, Sue, and it says chat and click there, okay. down at the bottom of your screen. Okay, I see it now. Thanks. Yep. And while you're looking at those, and I'm waiting to see if any hands come up, um, these are the results from that last um, poll question. Uh, pick three of the types of tools and information you used and health clearances again showed up most frequently in person and hand on evaluation by you and your mentor. Um, recommendations by your mentor and 
I don't know. Nobody said word of mouth or social media. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I saw someone put in the chat about it would be nice for new breeders. It shows to have a panel discussion with that's what we call the bar or our motor homes. Sometimes. <laughs> yeah. <that's> <laughs> yeah. But, but uh, yeah, I mean, and I think a lot of us are more than happy to talk, especially after a cocktail or two. Um, yeah. Or at least I, after judging. Information yeah. then, folks. <laughs> or, or, you know, I've, I've had people when um, typically I'm in grooming, the build, grooming building most of the day. And I never mind, you know, people come up and say, can I bother you for a few minutes? No problem. I'm just going to keep combing. So okay. <laughs> feel free. And I'll let you know if it's getting too close to time that I need to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know. Zone out. Yeah. I'd like to make a comment just in looking at this poll that's sitting on the screen in front of me right now because 90% are, are talking about the official health clearances and everything. And I do believe that's important, don't get me wrong. But I don't think that's a reason to breed a dog. And I think that, you know, it's good that your breeding animals have all their clearances, but just because a dog is a registered Newfoundland and has all of its clearances is not a good enough reason to breed that dog. Absolutely, I echo that in a huge way. It, it's, um, um, I'm a huge fan of Dr. George Paget, who was the canine geneticist at Michigan State for many, many years. He died young, unfortunately. He was about 63 when he died uh, in the early 2000s, which is a crime. I went to a few of his seminars in the late 80s and early 90s. And he, when we were asking him all these questions about, you know, what we should be doing in this situation, that it was, it was an all, the first seminar I went to was a, an all breed seminar. And he finally he took off his glasses and he kind of said, now look, you breeders, at the end of the weekend. And there were about 300 of us in the room um, at, at that particular time. He said, now look, there are two messages that I want you to take home from me this weekend. If you heard nothing else I said all weekend, if you fell asleep, whatever you did, if there are two things I want you to take home from me. First of all, it is really important. You see these breeders who've been breeding for 20 or 30, 40 years, and they've been spinning their wheels all along. Their dogs are no better now than when they started 30 years ago. And the reason is because they want every breeding to be perfect every time. They're trying to fix everything all at once in every breeding. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. You breed, you pick one or possibly two, no more traits that you really want to consolidate well in your program and you work on those. And once you get those pretty reliably in your program, then you can start working on the next thing in your breed that's of concern. And the other thing I need to be telling you people, you don't breed ugly dogs. <laughs> and, and what he meant by that was you keep your standard in, in your mind all the time and the perfection in your standard. And it doesn't matter if you've got, you know, great this or great that, great health clearances, whatever. If you're breeding a really lovely, healthy, well-tempered, um, clear um, dog that looks, a Newfoundland dog that looks more like a flat-coated retriever than anything else, then you are doing a lousy job. And I really took that to heart because that is, that is key. It's hard with this breed. You have to keep so many balls in the air at any given time. It's a really tough breed. However, you have to keep front of mind type and soundness and clearances and all these things, but they have to work in sync or you're not going to do anything as a breeder and you're not going to benefit the breed. I do see, you know, it is interesting people, we see everybody really wants those official health clearances. Um, but I have to admit, I get disappointed when I go on to that advanced search and I, and I'm looking for a dog, even that, that has just done all of the tests that we recommend from the NCA. Um, there's just there's just not a lot when, it, when you go looking for a stud dog and and there's just not that many that have published all of those clearances uh, i would like I, I i'd like for us uh everyone new breeders everyone to try to um get better at that uh as as we move forward because i think it it does help other people doing those the, the research mm -hmm. So Cindy, I, I appreciate that comment, but I think it makes a huge difference, the number of animals you own. So for example, my dogs, I get them echoed, my stud dogs, but I don't pay OFA to publish that. I 
you want to know about it, you can ask me. I know. I have it. And and I, um, and someone said, but it's only another $20. Well, when you have 10 dogs, 12 dogs, you're doing a lot of it. So I know not everyone posts their results, but again, that's where you've got to be willing to have some of those conversations. You know, and I, and I hear you. Um, <laughs> and, and, and I, and I understand that, but I think overall as an investment, either we get it posted somewhere else in some other database or somehow, but, uh, uh, but it, I think that history of it being there is, is a valuable. Down and that's something we used to do when we did the ROM books that we don't yes. have done in many years. Okay. And when we did the ROM magazine every five years, those things got published right. by the NCA. And so I just, you know, like I said, it's I not, it, it, I think it's important, but because my first look-see is not to go to the internet and the databases and stuff, it's to talk to people and it's to go in person to things. That's where I start. And then I do look at pedigrees, but I don't necessarily, you know, and yes, I want clearances, but I want to talk to the people that have those dogs. It's also because, but that's, I'm old school a little bit that way. And that, and I want to have those experiences. Um, and that, that conversation is super important to me. Um, I did just want to, I, some, a couple people have asked in the chat um, and Steve had said if they had questions, they were asking about what does it take to keep a stud dog in good condition? Um, obviously like anything else, you know, you're, you're feeding them a really good diet. You're conditioning them um, physically or, you know, you're, 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 I run my dogs, um, they run on the property, but I also take them walking and stuff. I think you also, I feed mine, um, the original Glycoflex um, as a supplement for, for sperm. Um, the muscle, the green muscle, um, and um, have had good success with that, um, keeping track of it. So I'd say those are some of the most important things is keeping them in good physical health, you know, mental health too. I think, I think one of the things we've seen too is um, exposure to heat. The summer really can have an effect on the sperm quality. Even if it's a temporary effect, it's very frustrating when you're trying to use the dog. People that, um, dogs that are out at shows and out in extreme heat in different areas, different conditions. Um, it's seen that, I've seen that affect dogs. It'll come back in the winter, but um, for the summer, you're out the use of the stud dog, basically. Yeah, and I think along with that is like, you know, I don't, I think you don't let your dogs get exposed to a lot of, um, you know, I don't take them to dog parks. I don't want them running around with a bunch of dogs where I have no say of what sort of infectious things can be mm -hmm. transmitted. And those are risks we take when we go to shows too. But, you know, so keeping um, track of, you know, where they're at um, overall health wise, um, I think that's super important too. Um, some, you know, someone said, you know, we see a lot of uh, fertility issues, males and females. And I certainly think that's not just true in dogs, that's true in all animals, including people. Mm -hmm. And I think some of that, of course, is chemical exposure whether that's, and our dogs lay out on our decks that have treated lumber, mm -hmm. you know, does that transmit? You know, I don't know. So those are things Chris will tell you. He, there are no fertilizers allowed in my yard. He drives him crazy, you know, none. There is none of that where I don't want my dogs walking on any of that stuff. If I see him spraying when we go for a walk, we go to the other, you know, we stay off any of that groomed grass. You know, we, uh, I'd rather walk them in the weeds than in the groom stuff. Mm -hmm. I just want to make a comment with respect to what Cindy said earlier. And in principle, I agree wholeheartedly. You know, people need to have a record of what all clearances were on all dogs. In an ideal world, that would be the case. However, um, the worry is that people tend to, especially newer breeders coming up, they tend to look at OFA or any database for that matter as the be all and end all. That dog is this. When in fact, the tests that we have right now to evaluate these dogs are 
kind of subjective and are they really real results? Uh, just hearts, for instance, I've spoken to cardiologists who've said, look, even in reading an echo Doppler, there's a lot of subjectivity involved. I, as a cardiologist, may not read it the same way as another cardiologist would. So therefore, it can make the difference between whether a dog is clear, i.e. aortic velocity under two, or equivocal, where everybody goes, oh, dog might have SAS, you know? And that when, once they're an adult, that, that depending on the condition, the emotional state of the animal at the time, the weather, the travel, all kinds of things involved, um, that, uh, that uh, aortic velocity could be over two for all kinds of reasons that have nothing to do with any problem in the heart. So posting an, a result on OFA is great. If you can tell for sure, that's a real result. Um, I've seen uh, you know dogs that have gone good at two, they would fail at four, you know, when you'd redo those hips for some other reason at four and they would definitely fail. So was that dog a good? So whilst I think it's really excellent information and whilst it's not the best tool, it's the only tool we have and it should be used. Um, people who look at those results and then take them at face value as that dog and label that dog, categorize that dog when it might not even be real information. I had an echo Doppler done on a dog a number of years ago um, I had her done at a year. I had her done for various reasons. Um, and the aortic velocity was in the equivocal range, but only barely. So I wanted her done to see if it would improve. Well, by the time she was three and a half, it was perfect. It was 1.7 consistently, but I spent, I think I did four Dopplers on that girl. So was that girl ever a problem? Her echo looked fine. The heart itself looked fine. It was the aortic velocity was out. So they would have failed that dog until she was three and a half, then they'd pass her. So was she ever a fail? So whilst OFA is an excellent tool, um, we really don't know. Once you post a result and your dog is categorized, it may not even be real, but you can't explain to the world a year later, oh, she's fine now, got a Doppler that looks good. So I have to take, I use these, I do all these tests for my own purposes, for my own uh, breeding decision-making process. And I have my own deal breakers that um, I won't or rarely compromise on and go forward. But it's, it's, it's tough to put something up on a database and have people point and say that dog is this when really, with all due respect, they have no clue what they're talking about. You know, it's, it's, it worries me when there's a database that people point to and say, he's this or he's that. I hear you. And I did say in the very beginning that to me, we have that one genetic test. Everything else is an opinion. Yeah. Um, and I think like, as it's just one of the tools uh, that we have to look at because it's, it's I think Peggy said, it's, it's like what we got. Um, yeah. And I, I do see differences in our dogs, you know, our veterans moving around at the nationals, you know, where when I first um, started out in Newfoundland's, uh, not so much. Um, so I know, I, I believe we're making progress. Yeah, I agree um, there. I, th I think we are. And it's just, you know, as trying to use the tools we have for what we have today. And then, and then uh, keep pushing towards science to help us uh, continue on. Yeah. Striking a balance between all of the things that we look at that's the most important and making the right decisions at the that's end right. of that, right. you're responsible yeah. for. Right. When you stand behind them, that's yeah. all anybody can ask for. Thank you know, you. you gather your information, you put your money where your mouth is, and there you go, see what happens. But I think we're doing a pretty good job on the health things compared to what we used to do um, many years ago. I mean, yes, we're, absolutely. The, the hip x-raying and elbow x-raying and the heart checks have made a tremendous difference in this breed over the last 25, 30 years with people checking with specialists and stuff and do, actually doing it. You know, it's more accepted to do it than not accepted. You go to a cardiologist, for example. Years ago, people fought it desperately. You know, well, my vet's a good vet. Well, well, until he makes the kind of mistakes that you put a puppy in a home that dies. Yeah. And he's not so good at that yeah. particular thing and you move on. But it takes a while before people really get into it. And I'm very happy with our hip evaluations. Elbows are a little bit iffy in my mind. But um, and the hearts, I mean, we've made great strides there. 
And we still have to go further. And I think that's why the OFA is now asking for dogs to be echoed when they're older, just in case something would slip by. And, and it's probably a good thing. Well, I think um, just all the questions we've had on health clearance, this is a reflection of the fact that it's more top of mind for people and it's important now. And we have come a long way, I think, um, with the emphasis on it and hopefully we just continue it. Um, but, I, but I think um, in the big picture of trying to do this uh, webinar and, and looking at breeding new flints is also trying to recruit new young breeders. You know, we've had people that have been in it like all of us for quite a few years. <laughs> But um, I know our committee is, is anxious to do all it can to help mentor in whatever way for young ones. And I think all the discussion we've had today on being transparent, whether it be the phone calls that, that you talk about, Ingrid, or, or the database that, that Cindy's talking about using them the way she does, I mean, all the ways that we find um, to be transparent may help young ones get in it if they can. Um, have confidence and have have an idea of how to so appreciate it mm. um so any other questions um from people on those four first four topics you know what's a good um dam sire combination and what are your tools um there's been a number of questions that have come in, in chat that i'm kind of dumping as questions you know into a a file of questions at the end that are a little bit off topic, but on those four, if, there, if there's anything else, um, and if not, I think I'm gonna move on to some of the, the next things I wanted to push you all to be thinking about today. Okay, I don't see any hands raised and anything uh, coming in on the chat. So um, I think we're heading in this direction. I'm just gonna launch this next poll. And if you remember, um, panel, oh, there's another admin. I've been, by the way, it's, it's remarkable. I've been getting chat messages, text messages, emails from Betty McDonald asking questions. It's fantastic. Excellent. Um, <laughs> call us. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I love how, how, I mean, this is, this is actually really wonderful. We have almost 200 people who are giving up a gorgeous afternoon or it's not morning for Ingrid any longer, is it? No, still a gorgeous now afternoon for all of us to sit and talk about how to make our dogs better. Like, how, how cool is that? You know, it's just, it's, it's really wonderful. So, so the next thing I wanted um, to pose, and, and these are almost more questions for the, the attendees, but I'd love to hear with the panel, because this is, I think, an insight into the mind of our, our, our panel readers. Like, what are you looking to improve and what are you looking to preserve when you have a litter? And how, yeah, you know, how do you go about thinking that way? Who wants to tackle those two? Well, I think everybody has within their own line things that they want to improve and things that they want to preserve. And so I think that you see different emphasis on um, when you do a breeding, how you choose the individuals for that and also in selecting a puppy. The big thing is in selecting a puppy that's going to fit with what you need to improve going forward. I had a litter many years ago that there were four females in the litter and I think five different breeders looked at it and everybody had a totally different preference of how they rated those puppies because they were looking at the litter from the perspective of what they themselves are, were needing at the time. Yeah. So. Um, for me, I'm always looking at shoulders in recent years, shoulders. And we just um, had a litter that had puppies with um, probably the darkest eyes I've seen in a long time. We're definitely keeping some of those because I haven't seen dogs with really, really, really dark eyes in quite a while. So it's all on what your priority is at the moment, what you need for for the overall dog you're trying to build and improve? I think there, there are two questions here. It's, it's what are, are you looking to improve in your own breeding program or in the breed in general? Um, and so when you're, when you're selecting your own puppies or, or deciding 
uh, what you need to improve in your own breeding program, that has to also reflect where the breed is going. So for instance, um, if the breed is, it seems to have a real problem in fronts, if you're noticing that you're having difficulty finding dogs with consistently good fronts, then you're probably going to translate that into your own breeding program because you have to be able to take what you're breeding outside to an, an outside stud. And where are you gonna find a stud that has what you're needing? So maybe you're gonna put more of that emphasis in your own breeding program because you're seeing that trend in, in, the, uh, in the breed. Um, so in, in the breed right now, I'm very worried about uh, the narrowness of fronts and the whole front structure, just as Sue says, I'm seeing a, a real, years ago, we had a lot more problems, but we also had more heavier duty dogs, I think, with deep, broad chests and, and coming at you um, uh, very, with lots of daylight in, in between there. Um, now it looks like some of those legs are coming out of the same hole in the front, and that's very, very worrisome. Um, too much length of loin. Um, a rise over the loin when they're moving. Too many of them don't hold their top lines when they move. Sickle hawks and flat feet have gotten to be a real issue, I think, in the last 10 or 12 years that, are, that worry me. And uh, ever-present insecurity. We're still seeing a lot of insecurity in the breed. And uh, you never know how much you hate something till you've had it. I've dealt with it. And, and uh, that's one thing that is, uh, some people say that I'm, I'm paranoid about it. Well, I think I should be paranoid about it because um, it is probably one of the single most uh, uh, biggest things that we have to deal with because it haunts you for generations. And, um, and there are various levels of it. Sometimes you go, is that dog insecure? Or is it just not socialized enough? Or other cases where you know that dog is desperately insecure and they're not in help and that, that's genetic. That's not a poor background or anything else. So um, I think that's in the breed that we need to work on. And personally, in, in, my, um, in my own uh, uh, breeding program here, in my own dogs, um, I'm really concerned about the length of the upper arms um, uh, and trying to find some place to go to help balance that. I've got a number of dogs I'm very pleased with, but I still see that trend coming through where they don't have as much as they should have, as well as the angle of that upper arm. There's lots of times you have great shoulder layback, but when the upper arm doesn't match, and, uh, and that's a huge concern for me and something I work on. Um, cat, the, 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 we should have nice tight cat feet. Um, I'm seeing a trend in some of my guys to the flatter feet as well, and I hate that. Um, I like to see a real tight, short, perpendicular hawk. And whilst I have some of that, I am concerned about it. And overall size, mass, substance, um, I'd like to see more of that, so I'm, I'm uh, prioritizing that going forward. And I always am seeking an injection of type because you can lose it so easily. You know, you take it for granted when you have it, and then all of a sudden it's gone and you go, what, you know, what happened? Um, so I'm always very conscious of that when I'm choosing, uh, choosing what breedings to do. I uh, I appreciate all that Devin um, and Sue said, um, and it is, it's very much, we each have our personal preferences, um, so much so, you know, we, we have things that we um, absolutely can't abide by, and then things that, you know, that for me is one thing, and for Devin, it might be something else. I mean, all of us would agree temperament is first and foremost, but when it comes to, like, what is a puppy that can't stay at our house versus what might stay at your house, you know, is two different questions sometimes. Um, so, you know, and that influences, I think, our breeding decisions. And that's why our dogs don't all look the same, right? You know, we're going to have some differences because we're going, um, we have one standard, but we're still going to have those things that maybe we strive to, to prioritize over others. Um, I definitely agree there's been a narrowness in body, which I hate. I want to see a broad dog. Um, that, you know, and it should be um, not just in the front, but the whole dog, there should be some, there needs to be broadness there. When we talk about a dog being um, massive and large, that's not tall, okay? That, that, that size of the dog needs to come from their substance, from their spring of ribs, from their bone. You know, our average height of a male is 28 inches. Someone earlier mentioned something about the dogs getting bigger. The dogs I own today are the same size as the dogs I started with. Um, you know, so I don't necessarily feel that I see that overall. I think there's a lot of fat dogs out there, so maybe they weigh more, 
Um, <laughs> as, a, as a breed, you know, I don't think I would say that we have bigger dogs. We just, there's sometimes some really tall dogs out there yeah. that are narrow or they be, be appear tall and narrow. Yeah. And, and I don't um, think that's what an ideal Newfoundland should, should uh, look like. Yeah. Um, for me personally, um, I can't get past a beautiful headpiece or I can, but I want a beautiful headpiece. And people say, well, you can breed for it. Well, you know, if it was easy, they'd all have it. It's not, there is no one particular strength or weakness that is easy to get rid of or easy to bring back. And for me, I struggle to not have a beautiful head because it's what I look at when they're laying on my deck or they're laying on my couch with me or they're sleeping next to me while I zoom their face is the first thing I need. So there's a certain style of a headpiece that I really crave. Every dog have it? No. But is it what I prefer? Sure. And so I'm always looking to preserve that. And if I have one that maybe doesn't quite have it, um, you know, then I want to try to, uh, I'm certainly going to be looking to bring that back and I'm going to be looking for those dogs. Um, and with the head, of course, comes the eyes. I, you know, again, dark eyes, the shape of the eye, um, we, you know, those things are super critical to me, um, along with the whole um, front assembly. And those that know me well know I love a good length of neck on a dog. Yeah. Um, I struggle when they don't have a good length of neck. And sometimes people say, well, if they have good shoulders, they have good neck. Mm -mm, they're different. Well. They can have good neck and have cruddy <laughs> shoulders. And Not I'd say easy. that's more typical, that you can get a good neck and still have really straight shoulders. Yeah. Yeah. So um, those are some of the things that are important to me. Um, you know, just overall, and it's, it, there's no easy answer to it. So, uh, or we wouldn't all but still be trying to do it 30, 40 years, mm -hmm. 50. I was trying not to <laughs> call out Peggy. Thank you, Ingrid. Give away our ages. <laughs> I think some of the things that you've mentioned are all things we're seeing all too often in the ring um, and they need to be worked on. So they need to, of course, be discussed with all of us and among anybody that wants to discuss it in the future. My Libs observation past what's already been mentioned is the top line croup and tail sets. When they look great, it's lined up on the line. And then one, one step off the stack, the top line goes, the croup looks like it's taking a ski slope down yeah. and the tail comes up over the back. This is really three important questions to address before it's too late. I think we're getting better on a little more length of leg and shorter backs, but the shape, the general shape of the dog going around a ring, mm -hmm. it's one after another after another, they lose it. Mm -hmm. Pretty when they're stacked up and then boom, mm -hmm. bye-bye. So if, if people want to learn more about those things, maybe we could expand some of our judges' education and breeder education programs at nationals to not only say this bothers me to have this top line and croup, maybe we could show it to people so they can sh go over their own dogs and feel for it and learn from it and make some improvements from that. Um, the, uh, the other problems are also evident in the ring, but that one really spoils the entire mm -hmm. outline of the dog when they start to move. And I think we need to address it because the, the croups are really getting bad. I would say, um, I think we've all, everybody's mentioned it before, but those proportions, uh, keeping that proportion, not just standing, but moving. Um, and so myself, that's what I, I look at my dogs very critically. And, and I, I, I think everybody else here, well, I mean, I tear at this point, I tear everything that's my own dog and others uh, apart, you know, uh, I'm tough on them. Um, but I think you have to be, right? Um, so that that's an important thing uh, is to look at your dogs critically as you can and see what you really would rather they have better and also while appreciating those strengths they have. Um, but yeah, for me right now, uh, and and I think of it not just in my own in my own yard, but in in the rings I see around the dogs I see around those proportions, uh, long and low, 
honestly, that's one that drives, <laughs> that drives me crazy at my house. If, if I had that, I, I, you know, we always say, what, what can't you live with? And uh, that's really one that, that hits for me. So proportions. Um, Steve, Steve will know the New England Club did a, um, a reading series of meetings, educational meetings, two, two years ago, I think. Steve and Deja hosted them at the time. And Joanne Brainerd built a almost life-size um, Newfoundland out of some kind of heavy duty cardboard something with movable- Sue, data. Sue, I just want to interrupt you. You got really, really quiet somehow. Can you maybe speak a little closer to your microphone? Am I better now? Yes. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> and we, we nicknamed him Mr. Mover. And all of his, you could, you could unpeg all of his joints and peg them in a different position. So you could put the shoulder straight and then you would see how the dog moved. The joints would move and you could see how the dog, it was a very educational tool. And I'm sitting here thinking, if we want to maybe do another one of these sometime, maybe we should try and get Mr. Mover involved. Um, so that people could see a lot of what we're talking about. Yeah, that'd be a great idea. Uh, any questions from uh, folks attending on things and how you go about determining the attributes that you want to improve? I want to share the results from your um, um, responses to that poll question, it said, it looks like most of you said, I'm going to rely on evaluation of her from my mentors. And that warms my heart because this really is something coming out of the NCA Breeder Education Committee, <laughs> where we want to develop breeder mentor mentee relationships. Um, so relying on um, communication and, 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 you know, engagement with a mentor is, is, well, that's kind of, that's the point behind the point of everything we're trying to do here today, which is really good to see. Um, some of you also, your own personal evaluation, which that comes from knowing the standard and reading your dogs, um, relying on her, uh, her record of successes. Nobody says crowdsource information from experts on social media. So that is good to see that you know what the right answer is supposed to be. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, so the other question were second to last question that I had formerly, and then I have a whole list of these that I've been um, collecting from the chat. Um, what is it you want to preserve when you're having a litter? Well, I'll start off <laughs> in my lines uh, with my dogs. I'm, I'm really pleased overall with the temperament that the, the dogs have now and the intelligence. Um, you know, sometimes you meet a dog and, and he's lovely and, and great to look at and there's nothing there. <laughs> You know, that concerns me because this breed is supposed to be intelligent. So even though I don't know if it's a function of my age or the fact that dogs are getting smarter, but they're getting way smarter than me. And that's making life a little difficult here. However, um, I, I am overall pleased to see that. Uh, consistent clearances um, that I have coming out. I'm really, really pleased about that. A lovely, tight, oval, dark, almond-shaped eye. Um, I've consistently been able to maintain that uh, with the rare exception. Please God, I can going forward because to me, there are an awful lot of loose eyes out there still. Um, so when I'm doing an outside breeding, I, I worry about bringing in too much of that. A sweet expression um, with heads that are not overdone. I really hate a head to me that is just not pleasing anymore because it's way overdone with flus down to their to their ankles. Um, I don't have that and I don't want to, to, uh, to risk that down the road. Um, the uh, neck carriage, I love to see a dog with an elegant neck carriage and, and I have a fair deal of that. Uh, top lines are fairly strong and reach and drive in very balanced movement. I'm really keen on preserving that. 
Um, overall, a very moderate dog. I, I worry about seeing a lot of dogs in the show ring that are not balanced. Their fronts and their back ends look like they belong to different dogs. And I think that's a huge concern in the breed. Anything that's overdone on this on, on our breed is a problem because it's supposed to be a very moderate breed. And as humans, we all don't want to go all one direction or all the other. That's easiest for us to, us to understand. Um, you know, if, if a tablespoon is good, four tablespoons is better. That's that's not true in our breed, and and uh, that's a, a focus that I try to keep in in mind all all along, as well as um, correct length, not being overly long, is really important to me, and something that I think I've, I've managed to uh, to preserve in in my lines, um, and very decent rares with short hawks. That's a big thing as well. So. Um, uh, I, I know that sounds like I got it all. I wish that I wish to goodness that were true. I could tell you if you had a section on what are you really disappointed in your stuff, the, the list is equally long. But but uh, those are the kinds of things that I'm pleased with. Who else would like to? Are we still on what we want to preserve? Yes, yes, please. Yeah. I know this has been a long slog. I really appreciate the time you're contributing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think we should all try to preserve all the good things that we have and work on the ones we talked about to improve on. That We need to do that as well. But overall, I would just ask anybody interested in Newfoundlands, whether they want to own them, breed them, show them, whatever, to be really objective about the temperament in this wonderful breed is what makes them special. And I think if we work together to never let the Newfoundland's amazing character be compromised, we'll be doing our job. Here, here. I had a beautiful bitch about six years ago that um, was what we like to call a skiptoid. Um, mm. And I've had some young bitches go through a kind of a fear thing, especially right after their first season. But then a few months go by and they seem to come out of it. This one never recovered. Um, she was shown, she was finished. Um, she would, would glom onto her handle. So the person with her, she would glom onto, but she never could recover when she had a meltdown. And she had all of her clearances. Um, she even wanted sweepstakes. I uh, could never put her in the whelping box. Just couldn't do it. Every time she came in season and I'm like, well, she's this, she's this, she's that. And I got a really solid. I was like, no, nope, couldn't do it. Never bred her. Just couldn't do it. You have to pull the plug on things like that. Yes, you you know, I mean, you, you have to. You have many to. of us here keep multiple dogs and they don't get that one on one. They don't get off the farm and they live back a quarter of a mile from the road. They get a chance to come around. But if they don't come around, everybody deserves a chance, yeah. especially when they're under socialized in kennels. But if they can't make the grade, then they do not belong in any box. And that goes for sud dogs. The male, yeah, I was about to say. I, I, I meant that. I just yeah, I know. Came out with the box because it, <laughs> what Sue yeah. said about her being a bitch and yeah. not coming around. And I, I made a similar uh, decision, so I know exactly where Sue's coming from. Uh, I had a bitch that just—I mean, she finished her championship, but I just could not. She didn't recover. Um, she just wouldn't recover. Uh, and 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 I've seen generations going through with not just my own dogs, but others, how those temperaments uh, traits really do come down through those generations. Yes. Yeah. And and I I no matter. I think that's you know all of us. It sounds like draw the line. Yeah. <laughs> and and I I and and new people who are looking at it sh should should do that as well and First. it's difficult because there's no ofa clearance for this no exactly. it, it, that's a hard honest you opinion have to really work through it yeah 
it is, I, I agree wholeheartedly. I've dealt with it as well. And, and it really is a wrenching decision to make, especially when the parents are great. You know, they have, you, have, you know, it, it's not a, a finite thing. Oh, the parents are going to produce this. Sometimes it comes up. Um, and I had a, I had a number of years ago um, in my 45 years now of breeding, co-breeding with mom first and then on my own. Um, I've had three dogs that had to be put down for aggression and their litter mates were all fine. They were, as a matter of fact, people were raving how wonderful their litter mates were that they were in those homes and, and nothing struck a knife in my heart worse than that. But, um, um, and can't, not sure where it came from. I, I have a sneaking suspicion that there was some insecurity in the background and it manifests itself this way. But there comes a point, then you have to sort of reevaluate everything and saying, how did that happen? And, you know, but as breeders, I think we have to assume it's genetically based. You know, we can give all kinds of excuses. Oh, we had this bad thing and st bad stuff happens and it can affect them. But, but I think as breeders, we have to take that so at heart and be really hard nosed when it comes to selecting against that. And um, it's, it's, it's painful, but has to be done. And it's very hard, especially for new breeders, when you're very emotionally involved with your dogs. And this breed is one in which you get very emotionally involved with your dogs. You know, it's hard to be academic about uh, about Newfoundlands. And um, and and I can see this stuff happening over and over again because people are not being honest with themselves about what they've got there. And obviously, I concur. And I'm also pretty nervous or uh, wondering what we're going to see over this next year or so yeah. um, with the number, you know, for this past year, we call them our COVID puppies or our COVID dogs, yeah, exactly. but the number of dogs that haven't been able to get those experiences that we normally, you know, I go to shows and the puppies go with and you socialize them. Even now, if I go to a show, you can't take a puppy with because it's a show and go and you're not really supposed to be walking them around. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, and we haven't had any out here and there haven't been the training classes. So I go for walks around my neighborhood, but then you had the people that won't come up to your dogs because of course everybody's social distancing. So all my dogs have learned is to stay away from people. Yeah. So, you know, and normally I'm lucky I have my brother and they come over. Nope, we haven't been doing that. So mm -hmm. we have a whole slew of COVID puppies that are going to be a COVID adults. You know, there's a whole group of dogs that are coming up on 18 months old that never got to see a sweepstakes, never got to go to puppy classes. Um, so I think, and, and that's where as readers, we're really gonna have to, to weigh some of this because we are gonna see some that are gonna be a little nervous that we're gonna maybe have to work through that we may, it, they may be more nervous than we would be typical of expecting. Yeah. And we don't wanna excuse it, but we're gonna have to work on it. And, and, and I just, it, it scares me because I certainly see it with a couple of my own just they just haven't had those same um, experiences and, and it's a real deal. And, and I'm worried about it from a rescue standpoint and all those things of what people are gonna see, not just our breed, but all breeds. Yeah. It'll be right. um, interesting, but, but hopefully a good Newfoundland with a solid temperament, you know, we get them out, they, they'll overcome it, yeah. but it is, it's just a little more work. More work but I, yeah. I, I think that's true that overall, you know, our breeds can take, I'm hoping they can take uh, the lack of socialization that we've had for the last year. Uh, I really do hope so. All right, so um, it, we have one more question that I wanted to pose to the panel and Full disclosure, I actually think this is the most important question that I wrote. Um, how do you assess how good your decisions were? Your breeders, you've been having litters, you put a sire together with a dam, you hopefully have puppies and they're, and like, let's assume, you know, you have a, a happy litter. Um, how do you assess how good your decisions were? One thing I want to just, I guess, first I would say, it's not by how many finish. There's so many people that believe everything. They have a litter of eight. They got eight show dogs. And <laughs> you've got to be willing to pick through them. And maybe you do. I mean, that's phenomenal whenever that maybe does happen. But 
And yes, we have a ROM award that lets us say, you know, they had so many finish and so they produced, but just getting a championship or being able to be successful in the working arena isn't necessarily what makes it a good decision or made it a successful litter. Um, would just be one starting point for me um, on that. So I think that that shouldn't be the, the, the first answer for some people. Well, I have, I have three, three things that, that I, I think I would answer to that, that I've jotted down here. First of all is every five years, I look at my program and say, can I say that my dogs are consistently better in the overall than they were five years ago? You can't do it any less than five years because you're not having the puppies or seeing them grow up or, or getting a firm indication. But every five years, I look and, and try and determine in the overall in terms of temperament, confirmation, health. Um, and most importantly, in a lot of ways, too, is what, what are my puppy owners saying about their dogs? How much are they enjoying them? Well, how, how few health problems have they had? Um, and, and just who are they in their own skins? And, and that really determines for me if I'm, if I'm on the right track and if I'm moving forward as opposed to backwards or treading water. Um, also, the level of consistency across the litters of those things coming through. Is the whole litter a really decent litter? Is it very consistent and very reflective of its background? Or is there only one standout and the rest of them are sheer duds? I got to send them up the Yukon someplace because I don't want anybody seeing them. Um, so that really tells me whether or not uh, my breeding program's on the right track. And without question, always constantly, if um, my peers believe I'm on the right track year over year, if the feedback them, that I'm getting from the people whose opinions I respect in this breed are saying that they really like what they're seeing from me or if they're seeing a tendency that is not so great that I need to work on or whatever. And certainly the show ring is a great tool to give you objective feedback as to whether you're on your, uh, from a confirmational point of view, whether or not you're on the right track. So those would be my, my go-to twos, I guess, in trying to determine um, if I'm making the right decisions or not. I think I agree with everything you said there, Devin. It kind of sums it up as to what you would observe in the breedings to see if they were successful mm -hmm. or not. Um, I think sometimes we're talking about current breeding practices. Sometimes that strategy may meet with a few bumps in the road along the way, too, because you all of a sudden have something you never had before. So you have to kind of address that. You've got to be flexible. You've got to be honest and you need to change the course if the combinations do not meet your expectations. Yeah. Fix the mistakes and enjoy the successes is what we call around here. <laughs> Being a breeder is not for the faint of heart. There are times that you will also have to be very, very brave. And we've all been there. Yeah. Yeah. I I concur on that and I, um, like Devin mentioned, I think it's this ongoing process when we look at a litter. Where are they at when they're six months old? Do you check in with your buyers? Where are they at at a year of age? You know, where's their soundness at at two? And then more importantly, you know, where are they at at six or eight or 10? Did you have a litter of eight puppies and nine or, and seven out of eight are still alive at age 10 and doing well, you know, um, I think those are important traits that we look at, you know, um, but it is a, um, and then definitely what are people telling you? And, and, and then when we do look at the show ring, are they only able to win in, you know, at a small local show or what happens when you take them out and they stack up against dogs, from, you know, more parts of the country, you know, and even the other country up North, mm -hmm. you know, how do they, how do we compare with each other? I think sometimes when we're together as, uh, at, and that's again, when you go to a national, are you competitive at a national? Mm. You know, I think sometimes those things maybe are part of um, how good my decision was. Um, and then what I may be able to move forward with. Mm. Um, and like Peggy said, the heartache, knowing when you've got to step back and it wasn't the right combination and not repeating it. Jean, Cindy, Sue, 
Well, I think they kind of said it all. I, a lot of it is feedback. You have a litter, you put it out there. What are you hearing from your puppy buyers? What are, what are you watching grow up yourself? As Ingrid said, it's not how many champions were in the litter. For somebody like me, I prefer to put all my puppies into pet homes other than what I'm keeping for myself. So that wouldn't be something I would look at as a statistic for me. Um, but it's it's the feedback that you get along the way. You're you're doing this all kind of in hindsight, um, and but then learn from that. And when you're if you have a litter that was disastrous and you kept a puppy for yourself, are you going to put that into the breeding program? Or are you going to rethink that? You know, mm -hmm. it's all decisions. All decisions. Um, I I would add that. Um... As we said, when we were selecting our bitches and, and stud dogs that we want to improve from yeah. what we started with. So, you know, one of the first things, you know, you do is watch a puppy that you kept and then the whole litter. How do they compare to the mom and dad? You know, did you, did it work? Did you, did you get the traits that you were hoping for from each of them or not? Um, and did you improve? Do you think that your new one is a little bit better than mom? You know, um, and if, if that progress is happening, in addition to what you've already all said about the feedback, that's really important. Um, but I think that one of the starting points is just taking a, a look to see in a comparative basis with, with their pedigree. And I, I like what Devin says about the five years, just looking out over the backyard and like, Okay, so how did these dogs compare to the ones I had five years ago? Mm -hmm. And I think we've all had hills and valleys along the mm -hmm. way. I think the breeds had hills and valleys along the way. But you have to recognize it and work at it. You know, it's just a lot of work. It's a lot of love, but it's a lot of work. My, my, unfortunately, my computer crashed at the beginning of this conversation. But oh, what, what happened to you? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> boop. Cindy's oh, well. gone to the winery. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, when I, and I, excuse me if you guys already covered this, but one of the things I, I look at um, and, and try to make a decision on is did the, like same health issues come up? In, in more than one puppy with the, with yeah. the litter, um, uh, you know, so, and then those things really do uh, say, okay, uh, those, that combination, uh, no good. Um, so I look, I, I do look at that and, and, you know, sometimes that information, you know, you get sooner than later, uh, you know, uh, potentially with elbow x-rays or hips or things like that. And some things uh, takes, takes way longer. Um, and, and then I, you know, I sure I heard you guys said the litter over time. And it is interesting to look out in your yard as you're walking around with the different generations and seeing how those compare. Um, you know that that's uh, that's very sometimes exciting and sometimes uh, you know uh, you know ah, I want that back from that generation <laughs> so <laughs> right so anyways that's uh, assessing how good the decisions were yeah yeah. I posted um, the results from the poll I asked on this, how do you assess um, success and widespread long lives, good health across the litter, um, evaluating your puppies at young age, middle age, older age. Um, and, and I think this you know, echoes what you, you, <laughs> you panelists were saying that it's a long game. <laughs> You know, mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it's a long game. So um, if, are there any other thoughts on these questions? I have a slew that people have um, put into the chat um, in various points over time. And I'm probably going to do some picking and choosing in the interest of, of time. Um, but um, before I go to those, do any people from the panel have anything you'd like to add um, with these questions that I've been posing to you.
I'll, I'll just add one thing that, that I think it's, it's so, and I appreciate you having us all together because I think it is important when you, you to look and your strategy years out down the road, not just even that, that one litter, but if you start even thinking, hmm, bringing this combination together, hmm, what might I want to do even, you know, years down the road with puppies that are out of that combination. So I think the strategy, not just for today and the individual dogs you're looking at, but keep looking out to the future, looking at other dogs that you see and how those might come in. Um, but I really appreciate you, you getting us together, Steve. I know there are a couple of people, there was, you know, how do we get to meet people? How do you get a good, you know, you say get the best bitch you can and, and start your breeding program there. So how do you do that? And, and I do think one of the big things is, is sometimes we just have to be brave and be willing to talk to people. Um, you know, we were all, and I wrote this in the chat, we were all newbies at some point, and I jokingly said, except maybe Peggy, um, but at some point we all were, and you have, and, and by personality, some of us are bolder and more comfortable talking to people, but, um, but that's the beauty of the internet. You know, you can reach out, um, and you have to be willing to make those relationships because, you know, will I place a really nice bitch with someone? Well, yeah, but we've also probably all gotten burned. So it's, you know, having that opportunity to, to meet with people and talk to them and, and trusting our instincts. Um, but I think most breeders, especially some of us that maybe can't breed maybe what the way we used to in terms of numbers, might be looking to work with some people um, that are really passionate and want to and want to share in that. Um, so, you know, make those connections. I would encourage you to do that. Absolutely. I, I hugely agree with what Ingrid's just said. And I can't emphasize enough the importance of if you want to get into breeding and you want to have a, a lovely dog, then the onus is on you to do the work, you know, build the relationships, get to know people, put yourself out there. And if you're within driving or flying distance at all, go see the breeder. There's nothing like old fashioned face to face, get your hands on their dogs, make sure that those are the dogs that you want to get involved with, because maybe you'll appreciate the conversation with the breeder, but you don't really care for the dogs that much. You won't know that unless you go and see all of them, not just the ones that show up at a dog show. And you can't really tell temperament at a dog show because um, there are, everything is very schooled and very controlled and very very regulated. Uh, you need to go and see what they're like in their own backyard and, and just being hanging out. And it's really important to make the effort. Too many people just send an email, I want a show dog. Okay, yeah, well, so do I really. <laughs> um, you know, it's not quite that easy. You need to be persistent and you need to go and visit the person and take your time, go and visit a number of people and try and determine what it is you want from the dog and what style of dog you want. I remember in 1988, um, I found that some of the dogs that I'd taken over from mom weren't kind of working out so well. And I wanted to see what else was out there and, and what other direction I could go in. And uh, a very close friend of mine, Mary Ann Scarborn and I got in the car and went to Ontario and spent 10 days up there in Quebec uh, going around to see some of the great breeders. And it was a huge eye opener for me because some of the dogs I thought I was going to go after, I found out maybe not so much, you know, it changed my mind quickly because I got out there, talked to them, saw the dogs and, and went from there. And so it's terribly important to do that. And that takes some money and some time. And if you're not willing to do that, don't expect to get on the internet and expect somebody's going to sell you their best they're not. You need to build a relationship. And sometimes uh, I think a way to get started doing that as well is by volunteering with, I mean, the regional clubs. Yes. It's, it's hard to get, it's, I, it can feel hard to get in there and get started, but, um, you know, people, it, but it's the bet, believe me, people want those volunteers to help. Uh, water events, fun days, uh, different things. I mean, that's how I got started. Uh, and then, and then the club members were such great mentors to me uh, with my first new. So I think that, you know, you, you show that you're willing to invest your time. You're willing to 
uh, help out and really get to know the breed better um, through, through doing that. Any other um, thoughts on those questions? If not, I'll move on to some others that have been posed. And and forgive me for the people attending, because I am looking, it's 20 after four. Um, I've already consumed two hours and 20 minutes of these people's times today, and I don't know how much longer um, everyone can stay on. So I'm gonna do some um, judicious pruning of the, the questions that have come in, um, but we've had this question come in in a couple of different flavors, um, just a sense of sufficient genetic variability in our breed. Um, you know, it, trying to breed only very selective dogs and being very critical and careful, is there a concern or worry about genetic variation? Um, is there trouble finding a stud dog that um, is a genetic complement to your program because of uh, of a limited gene pool, or are you not finding that to be a problem? It's a problem. <laughs> finding, finding the stud dog that complements your program is a huge problem. We don't have a lot of really worthwhile dogs in our breed. Um, to go to and uh, for our program, you know, they might be really worthwhile in another program, but for your own program, they, you might not have great difficulty finding the right stud for uh, what you're looking for. And um, um, I understand the issue with diversity. I think all, well, not all breeds, labs and, and goldens don't find it, but certainly uh, a, a number of other breeds have got the same kind of worry. And um, that's a real tough one because um, different breeders have different criteria as to what's important to them. So um, some breeding programs might not find an issue so much, whereas others do. Um, that that's a, a, a big topic um, that that could consume a whole afternoon. That could <laughs> or more. I find it a problem. I'll put it out there. Maybe my criteria are too strict. That could be. And I think that the question wasn't solely about stud dogs, although I think that your, your point's really well taken, but, but just in general, is there sufficient genetic breadth in this breed um, or is this something you're becoming concerned about? Peggy. I personally, well, I, we've talked about this in, in the breeder ed committee. And I think they're talking about it at the national level and at the boards or whatever, but they keep talking about doing surveys and doing this and that. Nobody ever actually does it, but I think it should be a concern. I know a lot of breeds are testing their diversity now just as a breed to see if they're in trouble. And I think it's something that we probably should be looking at overall, but I think that's something that the NCA would have to move forward with as far as carrying that out to get that information. Well, the um, NCA is. I'm on the health and longevity. Finding a stud dog for me is a problem. Period. Now, because you see a dog you like, they don't have any sperm. You see this. I mean, it's just. <laughs> and I think you know, COVID has has banned a lot of travel, and you can't go to where I can't couldn't drive to Devon. You said I haven't been there. I couldn't drive there now if I wanted to. Right. So um, you know, I think that. We're, I'm in a very frustrating kind of point now. I have a young dog that I've been using and using him on his clearances because he isn't even two yet, but there's nothing around pedigree wise that's fitting in what I think I want to do, you know, better than this particular dog. And, um, but I also, I think I'm limited because I can't travel right now. I can't, do, we can't do a lot of these things. And then when I do inquire about, I had, four or five dogs I inquired about about a year ago. None of them had any sperm. Yeah, uh, j just to uh, the Health and Longevity Committee of the NCA has a diversity 
uh, sort of subcommittee, uh, which Pat Randall is chairing. And we are uh, in conjunction with UC Davis. They're doing a diversity study. And uh, in the Newfoundland breed, we are in the process of sending out a letter um, asking people to uh, choose a dog in their of their own breeding to be part of the study. Um, it just is a mouth swab uh, that gets in, sent into UC Davis. So it's the start anyways. Um, I think they have 100 Newfoundlands already involved and it's a start, but I think that's the kind of thing we need to follow through with and, and uh, be much more active in and encourage everybody uh, in the NCA and else, else outside to uh, participate in that study in order to get a handle on this. And I, and I think that's great. I think sometimes too, um, at least especially back in the past, I, you know, again, when you would do your research of looking at pedigrees and trying to find these dogs and maybe you, you found a combination that you liked, but that, that particular dog wasn't available, but I've sometimes taken a chance then on the son or a younger dog or taking a look a little bit at some of those things um, when maybe you can't get what your, what your original thought had been but that's where doing that pedigree analysis has, um, has helped, you know, for yeah. what, well, and, and again, it's what you want to look at. Um, I can, I can look at numbers, but for me, it still goes back to looking at the real dog or talking to the owner of that dog or the breeder of that dog, um, you know, is going to be more helpful for me. Um, and going it, forward, uh, just to say, we need to be freezing more dogs. Too. I know it's really expensive and it's really hard, but if we're talking about the future of the breed 10, 15, 20 years down the road, we need to be freezing more because maybe they don't have a place in someone's breeding program now, but they may be really, really um, a good idea 10 years from now. Well, and hopefully getting great results from frozen will continue to go up because that's still a frustration with it, but the, yes. the, it's a, you know, risk and benefit ratio you know sure. you, you we have these wonderful older dogs that we want or you know no longer with us dogs and then we go through all those hoops and then we miss you know so yeah. um, you know you? adds that extra piece in that makes it harder yeah well that's one thing about a uh, management of a stud dog to um getting them froze up at a young age is vitally important to the the long-term future you know when you wait till the dog has gotten six, seven years old. And after that, to, to freeze them up, you know, you have diminished return there. So, um, but, but it can be done. We've had, two, knock on wood, two litters of 11 out of frozen. And yeah, you know, I mean, it, it, they are moving forward with the, with the science of it. So, um, but again, it, it was, um, it was younger sperm, you know, that we were using. No, one was older. But anyway, it, it is important to both to start by freezing them up early and then dealing with the reproductive people that are really have learned what to do. That's, that's a big thing. And those were with um, transverse, transcervicals too. Mm -hmm. So we're getting into science there. <laughs> <laughs> it's all science. We aren't doing the C-sections, but we're doing the other. I mean, I know there's Facebook groups and stuff for some of this stuff, but yeah, I still also, I think, remember that not all of us are on the social media or care to be, and we don't want our stuff out there. So I would still encourage people to make those phone calls and stuff like that, um, because it may be for different reasons, not everybody's comfortable or wanting to be on group, ch group things and group chats. I might just add this for all those who want to call up and do that communication as you say um of course in the last two years really I, my health issues have gotten in a way from us in our breeding program so we haven't been able to be as responsive but i know just in general even before the health issues that we had it, it's hard to keep up with all the communications i mean you try but you know it you know sometimes it's takes patience or persistence to, to try to get in touch with breeders. I think we all, you know, if you got puppies in the whelping box, you're not coming up and answering the emails, you know, you're, you're taking care of the, the babies. And, you know, there's just things that make it hard to keep up with it all the time. So just everyone keep trying to communicate, just do it with persistence. I 
another, I think, great question came in. It was a, a PM straight to me, but I'm going to ask it because I think it's it's a really sort of perceptive. What differentiates those breeders that manage to sustain a breeding program successfully for 20 or more years versus those that end up only producing a few litters? And in other words, the person adds, what does it take to really establish your own program um, besides being fearless and brave and a bit pig-headed. <laughs> and a masochist. And, <laughs> yeah. A <laughs> masochist, yeah. Money. Yeah. Sorry. It's expensive. Yeah. 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 Yes. You gotta, be, you gotta be in it for the long haul. You know, if you're gonna have a breeding program as opposed to what I call recreational breeding, where you do, you know, you dibble and you dabble and you have some fun and you go to shows and you have the odd litter, that's recreational and that's lovely, but you know, in the long term, what 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 does it really do? It puts dogs out there, great, lovely, but it's it's a moment in time. If you want to establish a breeding program, first, if you're not married, your spouse better be on board. He better be, otherwise, your marriage is going to end, or you are both going to stop before very long because the commitment of time and energy and finances and sanity is huge. So. You really have to decide that up front that yes, this is something we plan to do because in order to build a breeding program, it takes a minimum of 15 years and really 20 to 30 years in order to make a difference to the breed. And you know, everybody, when you say, well, why do you want to breed? Oh, I want to make a difference to the breed. Well, what does that mean? What does that look like? So you really need to get an idea of how much commitment you're willing to put into this. Or, and if you're a recreational breeder, that's fine. If that's what you want to do, you know, you'll help somebody else. Maybe you get a nice stud dog other people can use who do have breeding programs. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. Please don't think I'm putting anybody down for that. I'm certainly not. But the level of commitment is staggering. And if you have a spouse that supports you and wants to go along that journey with you, woohoo! You know, I envy the McAdams and the Helmings who, who had that kind of relationship and, and made it work. I wish I had that myself. Grace, the number of men I've shocked because they started to say, oh my gracious, you love those dogs more than you do me. Oh, that was a desperate, I knew we were over then. So this is the kind of thing that can happen too easily. So that's a big thing, having willing to have the financial resources that you need in order to, uh, to affect the kinds of things you want to do is important too. But I really think that in, in terms of the dogs themselves, you need to have an idea of what your goal is. What is the picture? Carve out on, get a graphic artist or do it to yourself. What is your goal that you're trying to work towards and then build a program that starts to get you there? Use mentors, not just one, use mentors, pick their brains and find out what are the specific things that will help you get there. Pick one or two things that you wanna work on to improve. And please God, choose the toughest one first. Don't say, oh, I'm going to work on ear sets or I'm going to work on paw size. No, no, no. Work on fronts first. Get that really well established and start working on the rest. Too many people say, oh, I don't want to start working on something really hard because, you know, well, then you're never going to get anywhere. You're going to spin your wheels forever and ever. So it's really important to really understand, do your homework first, then get your dogs. Don't get your dogs and then do your homework later. You're just getting frustrate yourself all the hell. I also think one of the big things, and it's a challenge more so now, is the number of dogs that you're able to have in terms of building a breeding program and maintaining a breeding program. And over, you know, the last 20 years, certainly there's more and more dog laws and restrictive places, and we live in more congregate settings, and, and that makes it a challenge. And, and so sometimes that's a bigger challenge and, and leads to maybe that need to partner um, and, and do some work together because, you know, having 10 to 15 dogs is not something that most people can do. And yet, if you don't keep, you only keep a couple, it's tough to breed. Yes, so, exactly. you know, you've got to, um, those, those are huge challenges. And I think that's where you, sometimes some people are having success by teaming up. 
that and that is really the key going forward. The the days of fifty dog kennels are long over. That and those are the dogs. You know, I, I get really worried too when I hear people say, "Oh, how terrible it is! You have all these dogs. You can't possibly look after. You're hoarding. You're doing this." They don't understand how a breeding program works. Keeping two or three youngsters to grow up until you find out whether candidates stay in the breeding program or not. Bringing in dogs that don't work out and then eventually move on. It is really, really key to make sure that you have the pool to draw on, but that there are a number of you with similar purpose and similar goals and, and, and can get along really well together and work well together so you can keep the number of dogs you can across three or four. We have two lovely ladies in, in Nova Scotia who want to start breeding. Well, one's already started um, in a small way. She's had a litter and the other lady really wants to start. They're very, very keen. And I said to them, look, I'm willing to do more than willing to do. I'm, I'm thrilled the bits you want to start but you want to be very strategic in how you begin and work together so that between you you can keep enough dogs in order to make a difference and establish a breeding program i think that's some of the best advice these days that that could possibly be and that's ex that, that partnership is exactly what i did starting out yes Kat, kathy hamilton the original old bay started back in the 80s 1980s and uh then i she thought she was done in the 90s and then I you know sucked her back in to and uh so as a partnership uh I mean we truly are a partnership discussing we don't always agree on everything and that's part it's absolutely fine um but we most importantly on the big stuff we do agree um and and working well together and then reaching out though and continuing those partnerships with other people um, I, I, I think that's a good way to, I, I hope to move forward. You, you obviously have to be careful with who you partner with, right? Yeah. Just like a marriage. Yeah. But it works. It works, especially with a breed like Newfoundland's. Um, they're a lot of work. Sometimes you wonder why you do it, but if you can spend time with people, it's amazing what can be accomplished when everybody works together. And it's even more fun. A lot of fun. It is. The fact that I could assemble six people at, with what, 10 days notice to spend <laughs> an afternoon exactly. is I think demonstrating exactly what you're saying, how we're working together and yeah. Well, it makes me a lot of things. Yeah. How are we doing on time? There's, there's a, a few more questions and then I have one more poll that I want to throw at people. But panel, how are you feeling on time here? 435. You've given a lot already. Yeah. Oh, just yeah. Maybe five o'clock would be the max. You can squeeze it yep. all. OK. So um, I, I have two in here that I think one's about stud dogs and one's about bitches. I'm going to. Um, Someone says, it seems like there's a lot of bitches with problems getting bred, people bending over backwards to get them bred because of short cycling, missing, what have you. At what point do you throw a bitch out of your breeding program because you can't breed her? Um, is it worth going to great or extreme lengths to breed a bitch? And I would insert that otherwise, you know, you really think would be a good contribution. You just can't. Um, you can't get the litter. I think you go as far as you can financially, mentally, physically, until there are no more avenues to explore. If you really feel that strongly about what you can do, but you got to keep in mind while you're doing all that, you're also trying to fix something within her that genetically might not be so good either. You can't get pregnant. Yeah. With all the things that are available today, there's so much that you can do. To make it happen if she can't she can't and have a lovely pet or move her on to a retirement home or something good for her but you can know, just do so much before you have to give up their reproductive life isn't that long to take mm -hmm. well, think the options that you have yeah i think it goes back to that first question is this truly this brood bitch is she that vital to your program and if that answer is yes, then maybe you're okay. I need to look at additional steps versus one that if 
they're average. You try to breed them once and they miss, you know, maybe that's, you know, a different scenario. But if, if it, it is really difficult, I still think some of the same issues we're seeing with our bitches is the same thing we're seeing with the stud dogs, um, whether that's, and with people is, you know, whether that's the chemical exposures, um, the various things that we're seeing out both environmentally and in foods and in um, just all the things they get exposed to, is that affecting reproductive? Because it's certainly not new to Newfoundland, or it's not unique to Newfoundland's. Reproductive issues are occurring in dogs all over the world um, and all breeds. So I think it becomes a financial thing. Um, but if that bitch is really checking all those boxes for me, am I going to go those extra steps? Yeah, probably. Even knowing, like Peggy said, it it may not it may create another problem because I may now have her daughter who's going to have that same problem, but I don't know that until I try, I guess. And you got to keep the breed going, so you try <laughs> to do it and then fix it later. But sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But reproductive problems are not new and unique in this breed <laughs> for a long, long time. That's right. But more modern science has helped us breed infections in bitches and nails and stuff, and we get a little better result that way. But I don't know how far to go once you've explored the science. Where do you go from there? I have to agree. I think that, um, uh, first of all, you have to determine if this bitch is really that important to your breeding program that you need to go through all those hoops. If she's a mediocre bitch with a mediocre background, um, you know, are you really going to put that much effort and expense into it? Whereas if she's a stellar bitch from a stellar background, yeah, then I think you pull out all the stops and try everything that science will permit you to do, um, especially if in her background there hasn't been an issue. If she's, if, if this is her, but it's it's not typical. If it's typical in her background, I think then you have to uh, sort of make a judgment call and say, well, I, am I consolidating something in my breeding dogs, in my breeding program going forward that's just going to haunt me forever? Maybe you have to draw your line there. So it, it's a big question because there are lots of ifs, ands, and buts uh, before you make that kind of decision. It's not a, a cut and dried if this, then that kind of thing. It's it's more so. But just as Peggy says, uh, this is nothing new. This is a tough breed to breed. They only take about, I'd say, 50, 60 percent of the time when they're bred. They're not Dalmatians. Gracious, I got a Dalmatian breeder here in Fredericton. It makes me sick. She's in my kennel club. They breed that dog. She, the dog only has to walk by her. He doesn't even have to breed her. And she has 14 pups. She had 14 last week in a litter. And that's just typical, you know. So um, Goldens, Labs, same kind of idea. We don't have that. Water dogs. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so that's why you got into them. All right. <laughs> well, and they also have eight gene markers. It's like a two different worlds. All in oh under my God! I see. That's what we dream up, right? Maybe, maybe when I'm ninety, we'll have that. They're relentless as a club on health. They've done a really good job. Well, and see, they, they have puppies. They raise them. They they do everything. Sperm can be five days late coming, fresh chilled, and you say, oh, I don't know. It doesn't look that great. It goes in the bitch. They have ten puppies. It, see, they're just unbelievable reproductively. I can't even get my head around that. I can't, I can't either. It, it's unbelievable, but it's it's kind of nice. Oh. It is really kind of nice to sit down with puppy buyers and say your dog cannot have PRA, nor can it produce it. They can't have this and can cardio problem, and they can't even produce it. When you have eight gene markers, I think it's a record in the AKC anyway, you're on the right track health-wise, you know, right. and the breed is in pretty good shape as far as when you look at them structurally and in the ring, they're, they're looking pretty good today too. They've done a very good job. You just have to want to live with one. Yeah. <laughs> you barely yeah. ever sleep, so <laughs> very different from a new feed, but they're cute together, so. So another question, this is the one that I thought related to um, a stud dog is, and it's sort of a two part, <sighs> what are your thoughts on missing out on a great stud dog because the owner doesn't have the time, capacity, whatever to exhaustively show, or if the dog's not yet been proven um, and then misses out on a chance? What are your, you know, it, is there, is it possible to miss out on a great stud dog? Yes, 
<laughs> okay, we're done. Bye bye. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll tell you one of the things, and this is true in life, not just in dogs. Regret is an awful thing. You know, mm-hmm. nothing ventured, nothing tried. I think if there's a, a stud dog out there that's got potential and, and belongs to a newbie owner or somebody who doesn't want to, I think you move heaven and earth to try and get that stud dog in a program somehow, even if it just means borrowing him to freeze him uh, or something. Make it really um, make it really helpful to that owner to get the deed done. Supposing he's never shown, if he's a really worthwhile dog, and and it's got a super pedigree and everything then there are ways to work with that person to get the get get it done and to get them keen and and to make it worth their while um but there's nothing worse than 10 years later saying damn i wish i'd done that and as far as using a dog that's not proven yet I mean, if he's, if he's got, they have to sperm. have a first time. There's a yeah. first time for all of them. If he's got good sperm, then that can be checked <laughs> before you use the dog. I wouldn't be hesitating on that. That would play, no. nothing, you know, it would play nothing in my mind to make sure the sperm was there and use the dog. Yep. Yeah, I think sometimes you have to be willing to take that that chance, you know, and I, that, that sometimes we do use a dog that doesn't have his clearances because we bred him young, we, we prelimed him. And we're going off those and have had those checked out but you know just the, so there's those occasions because you don't want to miss out on that opportunity or another dog maybe wasn't available at the time but yeah certainly every dog needs a first chance um and some of my greatest successes for what i would view as successes came from me taking those chances and using dogs that had never been used and dogs that um maybe only had two litters in their lifetime and one of them was probably what my what I considered my most superior litter I ever had so you know I think I those are all in the eye of the beholder but sometimes you have you have to make those decisions too it's not the most popular dog or the high, best winning dog you know that doesn't make them a great stud dog what makes them a great stud dog is maybe what they contribute to you um, I just I about well probably five years ago now I used a dog that was somebody's pet and I saw him at Ann Parsons camp in the summertime. I watched him grow up as a youngster and he just ran around. He'd hop up in the middle of the picnic table. He was friendly as hell, all this other stuff. He was a mismark. He was a mismark carrying a Lancer jean, which has never been of interest to me as a breeder. And we were sitting at the table one day and Ann was lamenting she had nothing to breed to. And I said, well, what about the stock? And she said, yeah, that people got all his clearances she never used the dog and I had five litters out of him. And he was a beautiful outcross for me. Um, and people ask me, how come you use that dog? He was never even shown or anything. They didn't care about that, but he did very well for me. Um, yeah, he did very well for me too. Thank you, Sue. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I think, you know, saying, well, the dog has to be this and the dog has to be that. If it's a dog that's pedigree will work for you. And you've watched, especially that dog, I watched that dog grow up um, and you think he's going to be healthy for what you need at that time. I, you know, I say, go for it. And we didn't know anything about his sperm until we bred to him. That's like a, a dog we used to, I, I, I first saw the dog, uh, it was either at a water workshop or a water test walking out of the water. And I'm like, oh, you know, caught my eye. I had no idea who the dog was at the time, uh, went and talked to the owner, found out, and uh, we've had several litters out of him and, and he's done very well by us. Uh, so, you know, but we were, you know, first, he had never been bred before. Um, so sometimes those catch your eye, you hadn't seen him anywhere else, um, can work out. So um, let's just say, I have um, one more poll question I wanted to throw up. And this is a two-parter for people. Um, and it's, it's sort of for me to get a sense of what we can do as our next steps. So this is two parts to answer. There's the question one and then question two. Um, 
these are anonymous, so I won't be able to see as the host what individual people are responding. So, so have no fear there. On the first, I just want to get a sense of, you know, in a really general way, how things have gone today. And then what types of things would you like to see or discuss in future reader education events? Um, check all that apply. Um, and as you're answering those, I'm, um, if it's all right with the panel, I just want to wrap up with my notes, um, having listened to you um, for the last three hours, um, some final thoughts that I've kind of pulled together. Um, first, and I think this message has just pervaded everything that's happening is we are a community that, that works and learns and engages with each other. Um, and that's really important to, to, to be in this world, that, that we work with each other, we learn from each other, we help teach each other, and we engage with each other. It's not an isolated, insulated endeavor. Um, it's also a long game. Having these dogs and, and working to um, preserve and promote this breed with purposely bred dogs is a long game. But if you're invested in something like that, you're really welcome to be part of it. Um, I would add that, that um, health and temperament are, are necessary, but not sufficient. Um, learning and adhering to the breed standard um, is it's paramount. This is, you know, this is what separates um, a nice, healthy dog of any generic breed from a Newfoundland that adheres to its standards. Um, this is also a hobby that results in lifelong learning. You know, I've been in the breed for some number of years. We have people that on the panel that have 20 years, 30 years, 50 years, and you're not done learning yet. You know, you've been in, you know, like, it's so fascinating because it can keep you um, involved in the age for, for decades. I'd also say we're producing some really nice Newfoundlands and the breed has moved forward in many ways, but there's still work to be done, which means there's a role for a whole lot of people because the perfect dog has not yet been born. And we're gonna keep working on that and working on that as a community to keep going. Um, if anyone else wants to add something, but those are kind of my wrap up thoughts coming out of today. Well, Steve, I want to thank you for putting this together because um, it's, it's these kinds of conversations that are essential to solving problems and, and helping people develop um, a, a breeding strategy or helping them to understand if they really want to go down this road um, and helping them understand how breeders, long-term breeders think, you know, why they do the kinds of things that they do. And, uh, and, and we do need new breeders, but we need good breeders. We don't need uh, uh, people who just put dog A and dog B together and produce puppies to sell. Um, I know that I may be going against the grain here um, because NCA and, and other clubs too want to see more um, well-bred puppies going into homes. But what does well-bred mean? It doesn't mean putting a couple of dogs together um, who are reasonably good. We always need to strive for better. And understanding how that thought process works uh, comes from these kinds of conversations. And because of the joy of the internet, we can do that now. So. I really thank you for thinking to do this in the first place and, and orchestrating it. Job well done, Steve. We appreciate it a lot. Yeah, very well done. Well, th thank you all. Um, I love how many people attended. I thank you so much to the six of you for, uh, for agreeing to sign on and just really sharing your knowledge and your opinions with, with so many people. Um, I think it's kind of an exciting prospect, an exciting thing that we've been able to do. Um, so thank you to the NCA for allowing us to uh, use the, the Zoom license. Um, and if anyone has any thoughts, please feel free to try to get in contact with me. And um, we'll be doing some more things like this. But um, thank you all very much. I'm going to end the Zoom I'll, and uh, we'll have it probably up on uh, um, you know, for people to view later, but um, thank you all so much. I hope you have a good rest of your afternoon.